Hey there, welcome to episode number 24 of Killer POV. Uh, this is Rob G. I'm one of your co-hosts from uh, Fearnet and Icons of Fright. And joining me as always is Rebecca McKendry from Fangoria. Hello! Mm-hmm. How you Yay. doing today, Rob? Wow, no interruption. I know. To the left, I know. Elric Kane. Inside <laughs> our... I often do interrupt. He's like a I'll admit, from the that's mic. part of my charm. <laughs> it's like his MO. It's a working charm. We're it doesn't for kick it. in straight away. Uh, I'm here, and you know what? Uh, today's guests that we are about to introduce actually uh, tie in. I will also be doing uh, Inside Horror once a month, mm. probably, oh. and Kane Hodder will be the next guest, which directly mm-hmm. ties into what? In some, the t-shirt I'm wearing right now? Because I'm wearing I don't know. Kane is that Kane Hodder? It's Kane uh, Hodder. Uh, no, the Kane headlock Hodder. I got last week. Oh, uh, you yeah. got one? He's put me in a headlock so many times. That's just, like part of the MO. That's like one of the things you, you do when you're, yeah. <laughs> I want to give you your moment. <laughs> Say hello, uh, people. It's, it's, our, oh. it's, our special, it's our special Friday the 13th episode. Yes. And joining us for this one is uh, Dan Farrens. Hey, Dan. Hello, hello, hello. And Mr. Andrew Cash. What's up? Hey, hey. And this is the creative team behind Never Sleep Again, and they have just done it again with Crystal Lake Memories. Dan directed and Andrew edited it. Uh, so Can I tell you guys, something about Never Sleep Again? What about Never Sleep Again? Uh, I can't remember why I was watching it. It was, for, it was to prep for some guest. I can't remember what, but Andrew lent it to me, and I was planning to watch it from like Friday to Monday. Like mm-hmm. I had planned this because it looked huge, and I'd never watched a making of that long. Right. And I sat down and watched it four hours plus in one sitting, could not turn it off. Literally wow. the best behind the scenes of a film I'd ever seen. Wow. For real. And not just saying that because of them. I was completely just enraptured in the... Because it had a real story arc to it about New Line. It was mm-hmm. kind of incredible. And there's stuff in there I had never heard, the Peter Jackson stuff. and yeah. also, So it was a really great film. Yeah, yeah, All the stuff with Bob Shea. I watched it actually... I did also watch it in a sitting, but that was because I was homesick. Not because you and liked was, it. No, I mean, I, I would have, <laughs> no. but I felt like... You know, it's like it's always like, oh, you hear how long something is. You're like, I don't know if I could tackle that. Oh, just yeah, yet. totally. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there was one morning oh, I was just home sick. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going nowhere. I'm going to watch Never Sleep Again all in one sitting, which I did. Wow. I was, was awesome. actually well, I'm flattered and honored. That <laughs> had come out and I was back in New York for some reason. And um, we were filming something and I'd gone back to work for in New York for a couple of weeks. And uh, we popped it in at the New York office and watched it at the New York Fango office all in one sitting. Uh, yeah, so I think I think that's like a childhood sort of like you always dreamed as a like well I did as a mm-hmm. kid you know like to have anybody from Fango know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, True. I'm flattered. And yeah. Uh, and so yeah, arguably I, I think amongst everybody in the room and 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 fans in general, there's been a ton of these horror themed documentaries that that fran- uh, franchise based ones that. <laughs> have been kind of uh, ushered forward by fans, people that really uh, mm-hmm. appreciate and want to celebrate these movies. But I, I guess, uh, yeah, Never Sleep Again is probably considered and is the best. It's definitely the, the quickest. Can I ask this about so. it, though? Did you know it was going to be such a big project? Like when you break that off, do you think, oh, this is going to be an hour-long extra feature? Oh, God. Or when does it become a four-hour <laughs> film? <laughs> oh, How did you guys even it, get started with it? Uh, you know, it was the, the timing was right because the Nightmare remake was coming along, mm-hmm. and there was all this buzz about you know, you know is there going to be a Nightmare retrospective? And and you know, kind of like like Rob did with the Psycho Legacy. You know, we were big fans of it, and like, should we do one? Sure, yeah. why not? I mean, okay. we had, we'd come off another documentary that we had, and that's where I met Andrew was on uh, the first Friday the Thirteenth retrospective we did called uh, His Name Was Jason, and. Uh, Andrew came to me one day with the idea of doing something on Freddy. He's like, you know, here comes the the, the remake is coming. It's like a year, what, a year or so away. Not even, maybe nine months. It was about that? nine, months, nine yeah. months. You guys only had nine months to put that together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. intense. It was oh, beyond God. intense. <laughs> I've never seen anybody look closer to death than the man over. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the title was, was over. The, the title was very apt because none of us slept, slept at all. Ever, well, we slept in shifts at the end. Yeah. Like we would. I would get twenty minutes. On the couch, he I, then somebody would wake me up, and I'd get back to it, and then Buzz would take over for him when he needed. Literally, he could only get like ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. Buzz was, it was, like, it was that walk. crazy. Wow. I mean, we were literally setting. It was like living a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Like you couldn't <laughs> sleep. 
longer than because if you did, mm. the show would fall behind, and you know, Freddie would get us. But uh, yeah, but right. it, 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 we sometimes felt like we were living in a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. No, yeah, it, because it, we had to keep setting alarm clocks and waking each other up, eating coffee granules, yeah. and everything we can <laughs> to oh stay awake. Oh my gosh! I mean, it was that. Intense. It was that intense. Did you guys think about uh, adding to it now with the now that the remake came out and looking into that, or just weren't interested? And uh, no, no you, you, well, as all the remake, note, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's even a footnote at this point. It's an, it could be an interesting. <laughs> story though of how yeah. I mean I was actually on set with that film and all the scenes I was in were cut I was living in Chicago somehow got on the scene oh, man. it was a library scene and I was I think it's because I was a bad extra because I kept doing things <laughs> to be noticed it's not your fault but I, I've yeah. never seen on any set I've ever been on I've never seen a director under more pressure it was right in the middle and he, he was having to answer the phone like four times every ten minutes from the studio from producers who were just like on his ass I mean you know he, he'd gotten them behind schedule already he was having terrible, like from what I could see, terrible communication with the actors. Like they weren't listening to him anymore. And this is all just from one day on set. Right. And I was watching it just going, oh, I get, I kind of like from that moment kind of go, oh, this isn't probably going to work. Yeah. You know, just it, from the sheer and, scope of it. And the slight connection I have is that I produced the movie The, the Haunting in Connecticut and our lead, Kyle, who was mm -hmm. in that, was also. He was in the scene that I was yeah. there for. Yeah. And he had just gotten off the plane, had come back from Chicago where they were making the movie and. We were actually doing a signing at Dark Dells in Burbank for Hunting in Connecticut for the Blu-ray release of that. And my first question was, how did it go, you know, with Nightmare? And he just shook his head and was like, it was the worst experience. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. He's a good yeah. actor. You know, uh, there's a Roger Corman quote that came to As soon as the film was announced who was playing Freddy, there's a Roger Corman quote that just sells it. And he said, in my experience, the most important thing about filmmaking is the monster should always be bigger than the female victim. <laughs> and, I thought, and then I thought about the new nightmare. Went, Oops! <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a cool cast and all of that. I just think they kind of missed the point. Yeah, right? there was a lot of lead up to it, and a lot of people were mm -hmm. really excited about it. I was yeah. kind of sad to see it fall so flat. Yeah. It, yeah, it was it was really just done for marquee value at the right. end of the yeah. day. I don't think the producers or the director really cared, even by their own admission, really cared much about the nightmare series. Hmm. And that's kind of why we don't want to go back and revisit the, the the old documentaries because it kind of tells a complete story. It, does. it ends perfectly with mm -hmm. you know the the disintegration of New Line and you know the end of sort of the Freddie West era. Yep. How did? Can I ask one for? Sorry, I'm, I know I'm yeah, let's, dominating let's this. Let's just, no, no, there's one thing I want to do. <laughs> I can't. I can't move on. They have a new movie out already. <laughs> no, I just want to know did, how did they get the rights to make that. That would be the only part of the story I'm curious about. How did? I, I honestly think it was Dunes. out of Platinum Dunes had been you know fairly successful with um, you know their remakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chainsaw was what kind of really put them on the map as far as that genre right. and making you know the flashy remakes. The flashy remakes. I think it was just that pedigree and having Michael Bay's power behind Mind them behind. being able to go to any studio. They did it with Amityville Horror. Right. Mm -hmm. Which we were, in fact, ready to make a sequel to that movie when, when they to announced. To the remake? No, no, no. We were going we were gonna to do a, like, kind of like a 25-year-later sequel to the original movie. And then suddenly they were going to remake the first one, and we were kind of dead in the water, sadly. All right, I rest my case. We can move on. <laughs> <laughs> now to the defense. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, so I'm you done. have a new film out, we hear. I do. Well, just <laughs> about to one. come out, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it's Crystal Lake Memories. It's, it's based on the book by Peter Brackey that mm -hmm. I was actually the editor of, and so I've been involved in this for a very, very long, 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 Oh. Not, not to mention, besides besides the book, also, uh, um, obviously his name was Jason, but all the special feature, all the great special features mm -hmm. on Friday. Is it Friday's four and on? Four yeah, through four, eight. Four that, through yeah, eight. yeah. It was weird because uh, his name was Jason had just, you know, wrapped. Um, and I got a call from the guy who was producing those bonus, mm -hmm. you know, the bonus material for the, the deluxe editions for Paramount right. of the yeah, Friday yeah. 13th. And they own part one through eight. And they had done one through three, mm -hmm. and they weren't very successful. Yeah. But he had heard, and this is the strange, you know, like, it's always like, it's not even, I don't even know how, it's like a half a degree, you know, from, <laughs> here's the strange part, was that it was same production office where a friend of mine, Jeff Garrett, who happened to be the third partner in the Crystal Lake book. He's sort of our, our mystery man. Like, mm -hmm. no, many people know about Jeff. He actually is a post-production guy. He was working on a show at the time called Psych, which is still on. Mm -hmm. Um was doing posts for that. And up the hall was Tim King, who was producing these bonus features for Paramount. Mm -hmm. And Jeff happened to mention, we were doing this documentary and he goes, Oh, I should, yeah, I should meet this guy. Mm -hmm. So he called me and, and suddenly Andrew and I were 
pulled you know from one Friday the Thirteenth in, uh, project into another, and we just launched right into that. But the cool thing with that was we got to have access to all of those archives yeah. of you know that Paramount had stored away for so many years of all the the footage, everything that was left, and anything that exists we got. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of fans that think we were holding out on them that we there was there's more to be seen for of part seven, you know, lost footage. That footage sadly is lost. Um, it was destroyed. It actually, mm. what we found was an empty box, right? Al, Andrew, you, yeah. you're the one who found it. Well, there, there was one box with a couple of little reels on it, and of course, you know, none of it was excise core Damn. stuff. It was all just like character babble. Yeah, was it? And, and like Jason, Jason the psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Kane coming, Kane yeah. rising out of the lake. I yeah. think that was the that, one that was, piece that was of film. About it. But but the crazy thing was like they they shipped over every freaking box from all those movies to mm-hmm. my apartment. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it literally wow. looked like yeah. like the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, uh, wow. warehouse at the end with it boxes did. of film piled up everywhere wow. that you're having to wow. step through this maze. Right. That's cool. Spent months but, going through all that yeah. stuff. But what what we also found in that part seven box, and I know that movie, excuse me, has its fans at our table even. Yes. Yeah, we saw it last week at we the did. Beverly. Me but I think right. it's the, the most sort of renowned of the series in that it was so heavily cut mm. by the MPA. I mean, they really had it in for Friday the 13th when Beekler came along with that movie. And yeah. not that it was really, honestly, any worse or any more intense than the earlier ones, but by that point, I think they were fed up. And they were like, not one more of these. Not, we don't make us sit through any more of this stuff. They just really had it in for the series. Mm. Yeah, I heard um, that that one had Jason hitting the girl against the tree oh, with like the, 100 the sleeping times. bags. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that, that's the one moment that I think maybe was improved. Oh, yeah, because, because yeah, I think yeah. it's so one, effective. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, one. it would have been interesting, as he said, they put in lots of gore and yeah. sloppy. Right. Uh, it could have worked. But it's but almost comedic now. Yeah. Right. It could be. Yeah, yeah, but maybe that works for his character. Or maybe I just perceive it. I think you're right. I think you're right. Kane Hodder says the exact same thing in Crystal Lake Memories. Oh, he, does, he talks yeah. about how um, he thinks that that was one of the rare cases where yeah. it was actually helped by the cut. Yeah, yeah it's, it's um, interesting. But that being said, what what the the final thing that we did find in that box with like these few outtakes. Which are actually on the DVD. So everything we found, we put on. Um, was a memo from some person, some you know, post person, post production supervisor at Paramount from like early '90s, I think '91, '92, saying okay to junk the trims and outs, mm. which means they trash them. Mm. Wow! So it's the fact that it was, you know, it, of course that was all the days before there was, a, you know, any kind of special features. And, yeah. I mean, nobody was seeing the future of what. This stuff, I mean, there might be any value to it. Right. And especially the way they sort of handled these films to begin with. You know, they were all like negative pickups for Paramount. And they yeah, quick and dirties. Of, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's unfortunate they just they just got rid of a lot of it. Yeah. Well, Although, yeah, though, you know what, there is hope. The only hope that we sort of <laughs> harbor is that somebody at Paramount grabbed it and took right. it home and it's sitting in the <laughs> hoarder, garage. Some hoarder. Some hoarder. <laughs> yeah. If you're out there, yeah. send it on. We'll treat you well. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's buried next to London after midnight. Yeah. Right. Uh, I know that's painful. Friday 7 in London after midnight. That's painful. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, look, they did just find a whole bunch more of Wicker Man. So, right. I mean, that's... It's, so you never know. Happen. I mean, but, but the thing is, I can say with absolute certainty is that everything in the Paramount archives has been gone through and, you know, yeah. but we get those questions. I mean, and there's not a week that goes by on Facebook that I don't get an inquiry from a fan saying, is it really true? Is there any more? <laughs> right. What are you holding out? What are you, know, what we are know you holding be, out? It's and they all really you. think, it's me, yeah. <laughs> that, but they really think that there's more and there's not anymore. That's that it. interest, that level of interest of fandom, I think, especially with Friday, because I, 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 I mean, I bet we all have our first... Friday the 13th memory but for yeah. me this was literally my it's not my favorite franchise but it was my gateway mm. like yeah, n- Nightmare is the best people. in my opinion Nightmare is the best nah. but uh, I'm just saying I, I gotta say I mean <laughs> Andrew is more of the Freddy guy so he really kind of in a major way took the lead on Never Sleep Again but yeah. I'm definitely more of a Jason guy but right. it was the, for, when I was young especially they, I found them just completely captivating I watched them all in a row and yeah. you know with parent, parents around watching occasionally going well, what are you watching and is this okay and I'm like yeah it's fine and it really I don't know what it was because I look back now and they're they're very simple, right. like mm-hmm. much more simple than you know anything like right. Phantasm or Nightmare right. on Elm Street, right? Right. Uh, so, what do you think it is about it about the series that has captured fans for so many years, and what even get maybe got us when we're so young about these? God, I, I take a pause on that one because it's just there's so many things. I think that there's an iconic boogeyman in Jason. Mm-hmm. I think there's when they created the mask when the hockey mask came about yeah. in Part Three. That kind of solidified it. There was an iconic image that they could kind of keep, keep bringing back. And I think it's also that primal thing of like going in the woods or being with your friends right. and something something is out there. Mm-hmm. There's a primal sort of force of nature. So there's all of that stuff. But I also think there's there's something to be said about 
the survivor characters. It's always yeah. most people talk about Jason. I always related to the survivor girl. And that's, uh, she was sort of the outsider. She was the one outside looking in and not really a part of the group. And I think everybody can kind of, you know, at least that relates to these movies, can relate to that character. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a survival thing. There's a sort of, um, you know, we're, when you are part of a group that feels like you are outside the mainstream, sometimes you feel marginalized. And I think part of that is the ability to fight back and survive the night. And I think that's a big part of what these movies mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. tend to. I think also as as a kid, I think, you know, Fridays were, you mentioned simple. I I felt like it was like the quintessential, like, like camp, like, you know, summer camp horror movie. Like Mm -hmm. I'd rent everything from the store, but for some reason that seemed to be the best of the bunch when it came to like, all right, kids out in the woods, there's a boogeyman after them. One of them always survives to fight them all. I don't know. There was something about that simplistic formula. It's almost like the campfire tale. Like Mm -hmm. those, absolutely those are, those ghost <clears throat> stories are always forever, like very, they're simple to the point and people always remember them. And it just, it, it felt to me as a, as a really young kid, like the, the like my generation's version of the campfire. Mm-hmm. Kind of like yeah. other horror movies are like that, but I'm like, but this is the original or this is the one that seems like, you know. Well, you also have to remember Friday the 13th was the one, the original one that took this <clears throat> new genre, which Halloween sort of had sort of, tra- you know, blazed the, 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 the trail open for other films like this. But it's the one that made it a mainstream movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was a it was a major release from a major film studio, handled like a, a big studio movie, and that was unheard of at that time. And also, it's pre VHS, it's pre home video, so it was like the thing that you had to sort of sneak into. Mm-hmm. You had to kind of you know it was it was taboo. Yeah, and I think was it the first to to kind of uh, in terms of gore, like the level of gore, because. Yes. You know, Halloween is obviously a goreless movie. That's what mm-hmm. makes it so famous. But I, I feel like, if I remember correctly, seeing vintage like footage of like Tony Timpone talking about Friday Thirteenth. Yeah. Like in 1980, no one had ever seen no. anything like yeah. this. Before. Especially well, not is. on the big screen. I mean, right. that was reserved for like you know the CD theaters, but you know it didn't come to like a theater in a town yeah. across America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom and, Savini was very much the star, I think, of that first movie. Yeah, and that and in the 80s in general, that that was sort of the beginning of that era where the makeup effects guys were really running these shows and, mm-hmm. and they were sort of in a way the superstars of the movie. Yeah. I think I think even Tom mentioned something like, you know, it's kind of like porn, you know, the the <laughs> you know, the big money shot is the big kill. Yeah. There's the, actually you know, a book that discusses that entire concept that the eighties, um, yeah. the money shot of everything that porn transformed onto the screen right. in how much ooze you could put out. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and I mean then you get an arrow through the neck. It's perfect. But it's yeah. also, you know, we were all kind of at least I was and you guys were younger, but uh you you know, it was that time where, you know, you are tempting fate. You're, you know, I was like, I was like the perfect age. I was like 12 when the first yeah. movie came out. So, yeah, we got to talk know, about that. Was, what was, that was your first experience seeing the first one? No, actually, I didn't get in until part two. Okay. And what it was, was <laughs> true story. Uh, she'll probably listen to this. I, uh, <laughs> uh, there was a weekend when that movie was when part two opened. So it would have been May of 81. Dating uh-huh. myself a bit. Um, my mother happened to be out of town that weekend or was going out of town. And we had, you know, kind of like the cool babysitter that weekend. Nice. She was like, you know, <laughs> whatever, a senior in high school. So she, you know, and, and her brother was into Fangoria. Mm-hmm. She, he had the issue, and which I had never seen in my life. Gateway I didn't, drug. I, I knew about yeah. Starlog, but Gateway I didn't know about drug. didn't know about Fangoria. But there was like she had like like he was like twenty two, you know. So I thought he was cool. She went with her like his room, and she's like, oh, and I was like, she's like, I don't want you looking at this magazine. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah look at it, look at it. <laughs> so I looked at it, and there was like Mrs. Voorhees' head on the table oh, yeah. on the altar. Nice. I'm like, I have to see this movie. And she's like, hell no, I'm not taking you to that. And I'm like, yes, you are. You have to take me. She's like, no, I'm not. Your mother would kill me. I'm never, you know, my mother was a devout Catholic type. So uh, finally, I just, she gave in. She's like, I'll get take it. So it was a Saturday afternoon. I'll never forget. And we, we had to walk to the theater. And uh, I was so traumatized after it. <laughs> I had never seen anything like this in my life. I thought, number one, I was going to hell for watching it. Number nice. two, I thought Jason was under every dark shadow that I crossed. There was a, a room in our house that didn't have a window, yeah. and it was black when you walked by, and I would throw the door open and run by as fast as I could to <laughs> get away because I thought he was going to jump out at me. So that was my first, but I was so traumatized by it. And then the same year, they showed the original Halloween on network television. Mm-hmm. It was an NBC movie of the week that they would. And then I remember them showing like prom night, movie of the week on NBC. It was that era. Um <laughs> But seeing Halloween, I think that's what really nailed it for me. It was those two. 
So I th- after I got off the, over the trauma, I wanted to figure out how they did it. Yeah, yeah. And I, and for uh, it's I my mean, kinder trauma. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could have seen your face where they reveal his face in number two. Uh, I jumped, that's just one of those moments. So where you're like, never, oh, you know what? When he jumped through that window, yeah. I jumped out of my chair. And the yeah. one that I'll never forget, I didn't jump out of my chair. I leapt onto the floor of the theater, <laughs> and I was watching the rest of the movie between the two seats in front Aww. of me. Was where uh, the guy gets his throat slashed, and the girl. Finds him and she turns and she screams into the camera and like like shot cuts to a guitar or something and that's uh, funny. that made me jump so hard I leapt onto the floor. See, I remember doing that so for that's the not librarian scary. Um, and yeah. Ghostbusters. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's how young I was in the theater wow. of Ghostbusters. Oh I was jumping on, the, and that's kind of embarrassing now. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but, I mean, everyone should know that Dan uh, also wrote Halloween Six. six that, yeah, that was yeah, uh, yeah. kind of his entry into the, yeah. the genre. No, it was my first yeah. studio produced movie, and I mean, what what. You know how lucky was I to yeah. you know to be able to have that credit and and to be able to do that at such a, a young age. It was mm. it was an honor. And you had told me growing up that that uh, like when you were a teenager, you used to write a lot of like fiction, like Halloween and Friday Thirteenth, oh, like yeah. fan fiction. Those are what I it, all the <laughs> kids that I went to junior high and high school with. When you know, like when we have our every five years we have a reunion. They're not surprised at all because those are the movies that I was making in the halls of Santa Rosa High, which here's a really interesting hmm. story. I went to Santa Rosa High School, which is where Wes Craven was supposed to film Scream. Mm. Oh, wow. And th- because of the violent content, the school board turned him down yeah. and kicked him out, and they had to go find another place. And it turned into like a, a federal lawsuit, a huge, huge deal. Hmm. And I remember at the time I was being called by Dimension Film, so I'd just done Halloween 6 with, and they're like, we heard you went to that high school. <laughs> What is their problem? I remember calling like my English teacher and saying, "What's going on here? Why? What is this?" I was wow. dragging dead bodies down that hall, and you know, and 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 blood flying all over the place in these <laughs> movies, and they encouraged it. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, like, ten years after the fact was 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 a different story. Mm. Um, I think it was probably around the Columbine. It era. was that yeah. was ninety six, and I think Columbine was like ninety four, ninety five. Yeah, so yeah, it was probably there was that fear going on, and it, it was like there was a town hall meeting about it, and we you know, Andrew and I and 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 the same team. We actually after we did Never Sleep Again, we did a, a retrospective on Scream for the Bio Channel, mm-hmm. and so we were, I was able to go to my high school and ask them, you know, did, what was what your problem? What was their comment on it? But, you know, I think they're a little ashamed of it now. I think they're. It looks they're like they f- would have missed a big opportunity. Well, yeah, to and be they like also a landmark in film world. Absolutely, and I think they realize. And also, there hasn't been a whole lot of film production in Santa Rosa, California, since since hmm. then. You know, I think it, they got a bad reputation uh, as a result of it. Yeah. Um, hmm. But right. so it's weird connections. Everything <laughs> has a weird circle, weird 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 circular sort of. Uh, you know, it all kind of comes full 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 round with 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 these stories, but. Uh, um, but the real introduction I had with Friday the Thirteenth was I, you know, like Rob was saying, you know, I was I was writing all these scripts and casting my friends in these movies, but um, but I wrote a letter when I was fourteen to mm-hmm. Frank Mancuso Jr. The composer. The, no, no, he was oh, actually sorry, the, producer. the producer. Yeah, yeah, the producer of the of the series. Who, you know, at the time was all of like 23, 24 years old, and he was the son of the, the president of, of uh, distribution for Paramount. It was Frank Senior. Um, and he got involved as associate producer on part two, and then he took over producing three, four, five, all the way through eight. And uh, but Frank wrote back to me. Wow! And it was the first letter he sent me. I think that really, like, it was the first acknowledgement I ever got. And it was at such a young, impressionable age that I just, I, I think, without that letter and without his uh, kind of seal of approval that I got from him, uh, I don't think I ever would have pursued it. So I really have to say that Friday the 13th, you know, in a major way, kind of gave me a, a start. Wow. And uh, we're still in touch. He did his very first on-camera interview yeah, about Friday the sure. 13th for this show that we're, we're about to come out with. And uh, How'd that it was go? an honor. It was interesting. It was great. Because he, he's he, never really talked never, about it. Never, never. No, yeah. He was always kind of that, you know, camera shy, but a little, you know, very behind the scenes guy. He would do occasional Fangoria interviews and things like that, but not not frequently. Um. It was interesting. It was, you know, and, and, and it wasn't just the one letter. I mean, Frank and I kind of were pen pals over the over mm-hmm. the years, you know, and he got me my first pitch meeting on the TV show when I first moved to L.A. when it was Friday the 13th, the series was going on. Right. Um, do I, you guys actually, delve into that in the movie? We do. Yeah. Okay, cool. We do, we do. And That's then like he, also, he also actually invited me. It was my first time ever st- stepping onto the Paramount lot, and I was invited to the first cast and crew screening of Part 7. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. So interesting. So he really was a like a mentor figure for me. I have to say in a big way. So this this show in a big way for me is is for him. 
You mm-hmm. know, it's it's my sort of tip of the hat. Feels like you've yeah. come full circle. At that, this point. That's what this yeah. is all. That's what this all is. Yeah. And Andrew understands more than anyone. Has put up with this for longer than anyone. <laughs> Very ever. long time. Yeah. Yeah. He's. I mean, nobody's been more supportive and genuinely a, a friend and and somebody who's just we've. We've just been through thick and thin, so we're, you know. Yeah. And that's good, buddies. Uh, yeah. Where, yeah. Where'd this start for you, Andrew? Oh, Friday the 13th? Friday in general, yeah. Uh, Friday remember? the 13th to my generation was sort of like the, the USA up all night kind of thing. Yeah. That's where, my story. It was always on. It was always it was like on. one of the different versions was always on. Yeah, it was always like one through seven or one through eight. And, and, and for my age, it was like those movies that you would sneak down at night and flip on at like 11 o'clock at night. And, and I remember them playing them in order, too. Yeah, they would always the do these long, long It'd be marathons like all night long, nice. nothing but. And I remember so. at a funny out of all the Friday movies, the, the thing that scared the shit out of me the most was that teaser trailer for Part Eight. I saw that as a kid, <laughs> and I was fucking traumatized. That's still, awesome. Still one of the greatest teasers of all it time. It is a great yeah, teaser. Yeah, I mean, well, marketing Jeff Katz, who is kind of I think our our uh, the voice of the geeks in our show, and uh, did a great job. Um, but he talked about how that was just like a marketing home run. I mean, what a genius <laughs> idea. Movie. Not that yeah. the movie was a good movie. <laughs> right. Or even really a Friday the 13th movie. It certainly wasn't much of it in New York, but I mean, what a great marketing campaign. Yeah. Yeah. We, we actually get into that and we get into the fact that there was a lawsuit that the uh, Tourism Board of New York filed against Paramount for using the, the I poster, Heart New yeah. York I know so where, many people that have that tattoo. Yeah. It's very popular in the New York car scene to get the I love New York with the Jason coming really? out. Really? Awesome. And it's the I, band it's, poster. So many have that. Yeah. And yeah. I remember being in New York at the time, and the entire subway terminal was like plastered with that poster. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then they had to take it down. That's cool. Yeah, I remember yeah. that too. I was really young. But the, the big deal, back in those days, going to Fango Week and a horror shows, I'd always go to the poster guy. And it was like, I was on the hunt for that <laughs> I, I <laughs> heart New York poster. Totally. They, they pulled it. Yeah. And actually, even to take it one step further, talk about weird connections. During that time period, I was actually working my day job was as an assistant at the MPAA. Right. You oh, told me oh, that wow. before. You should Not have snagged kidding. a poster. <laughs> <laughs> Not only did I snag it, I was given the original rejected poster. They give uh-huh. those things out? Well, they're not supposed to, but in of that case, <laughs> in that case, they knew my affinity for this series, and they said, this is being rejected. If you want this, you can have it. And, wow. I, didn't, and I still have it, and it's actually in the show. We actually show oh, the great. original That's rejected so cool. With disapproved stamp on it. It's yeah. like a badge of honor now to get a rejected poster. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think films but try it, for And that. the only difference was it was the I Heart New York, but it had more blood on it. Mm-hmm. And they won't allow that. Or at the time they didn't. I don't, they've, they're, they've become a much more liberal organization now, I've, I believe. Um, mm. Some of the same people are still on the board after all these years. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. Since then? Oh, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Round Robin favorite F Friday 13th film. Everyone. Go. Seven. Four. And why? Why? I love that it's it's more comedic. But I mean, uh, my gateway drug was definitely like part three. Yeah, that was. But um, yeah, seven's my fave. Final chapter. Yeah. yeah. It's the best directed out of all of them, I think. And, and Tom Savini's effects. I mean, that was right before Day of the Dead where he, in, in my opinion, like a, a perfected physical makeup effects. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's. And you got it right. And you like Feldman? Feldman? Mm. Feldman's great. Yeah. He, I think he is what gave it a little bit of heart right when it needed it, where, right. when it could have been wearing out. Right. Well, he, was, I think he was our age. That, mm-hmm. That's yeah. what I remember. Yeah. Four well, is my again, favorite, too. That's what I was, was saying about the us. outsider, the survivor character, mm-hmm. that's a bit of an outsider, who's a bit of an outcast, who's doing weird things that, you know, doesn't fit in with the, the crowd, but somehow he has to be the one to be clever and sort of figure it out. And I think yeah. that I think it definitely tapped into that. And, and all well. the characters in that movie have a little bit extra dimension to them mm-hmm. that you see in the other Fridays. Mm-hmm. You've got, you know, the, the great chemistry between, you know, um, Crispin. Uh, Crispin and um, uh, Lawrence Monison. Lawrence Monison. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were great. And yeah. they cast it with semi-familiar faces, which they had never done before. Right, mm-hmm. yeah. right. You know, at that time, there was like Peter Barton, who was on the show called The Powers of Matthew Starr, which also had Amy Steele from part two. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, the, uh, see, it's just, it never ends in my head. Like, it's constantly <laughs> circling. In, in which is your favorite? Um He'll kill me if I don't say part three, so I have to say part three for my <laughs> good friend and entertainment attorney, Larry Zerner. Ah. Uh, who course. also plays trivia. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We we him I should times. say, for those who don't yeah. know, he was Shelley in part three. Yeah, yeah, which is And there would be huge. no hockey mask no if hockey it weren't for his Wait, character. He's an entertainment lawyer? Yes. yes. That's, what he does. Yeah. That's what he does now. No and and, 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 you can talk and about he's it. a wizard trivia. It, he's very good. In fact, he'll text me. I Because I've been hidden away in a, in a cave working on the show for so long, I haven't been able to go to the trivia nights. Oh, but, man. Uh, if you join his team, they yeah. want some competition. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Well, at least with these movies. But here's a geek thing. When I was, I was actually 
sort of hunting around for an entertainment lawyer about 10 years ago. And there was a list of names I was given by, referred to by an agent. And uh, uh, I went down the list and just was calling people and saying, you know, here's what's going on, blah, blah, blah. This is who I am. And his name was on the list, but I didn't connect the name because mm-hmm. who would have thought, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. But he, he was on the phone with me. And within two minutes, I'm like, can I ask you a question? Because <laughs> I recognized his voice from Friday. Yeah. Oh, time. my God. That's funny. Yeah. And obviously you picked him because... Of course. <laughs> without a doubt. This is the guy. There would be, I wouldn't be doing any of this, honestly, either, if it weren't for Larry, because he's kind of like the cheerleader of the whole series. Anytime there's a screening or a part three something, mm-hmm. a, a retrospective, he's the guy that rallies the cast and makes the calls. And, you know, he's... he's uh, Out of all the cast members, I think he gets the most excited about it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Cool. You've, yeah. you've got to tell him the Jesus Christ superstar story. Oh, God. That is oh, amazing. that's right. Yeah. Well, my other... This, Talk about weird dichotomy. <laughs> I love many things in life, but I also love Jesus Christ Superstar, which actually <laughs> is showing, good. which is showing the 40th anniversary this Monday night in Hollywood. He was Ted, like, he was at Ted Neely. Amazing. Ted and was, was in uh, Jump Cut then because to meet Darren Bowsman. He was not. He walks in and it, w- it was my favorite moment so far since being there because uh, there was a comedian who's on that show, Whitney. What's his name? Whitney. Chris Delia. Yeah. yeah. That, like whatever. So Ted Neely walked in? Yeah. So Ted Neely's in there and Ted Neely grabs this comedian. Ted Neely, Jesus Christ, Jesus grabs this comedian. Christ. And the comedian looks down and goes, yeah. And the, Ted Neely goes, I just want you to know that you're really fantastic on that show. And the, and the comedian's just like, oh, thanks, man. And walks off. And, he, and I'm just watching it. Little knowing that's Jesus Christ yeah. just anointed him. And next him. time he came back in, I said, hey, just so you know who that was, he goes, I love Jesus Christ. Well, I'm sorry, yeah, I can't believe it. it great. My, his mind is not clearer now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, God, where the hell were we going with this? Oh, you love so Jesus Larry, Christ, yes, I do. So about five or six years ago, there was a benefit performance. It was a big deal here in Hollywood. They reunited the original cast of Jesus Christ Superstar. Jack Black played King Herod, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was a really expensive event. And this was like, you know, $500 seats. Huh. And one day Larry calls me and he goes, you are going to see Jesus Christ Superstar because I got the tickets. I'm like, I fucking love you. And I, <laughs> so there we were in like celebrity circle. And I'm not kidding you. Directly in front of us was Harrison Ford and Callista Flockhart. Behind us was Gina Davis and somebody else. David Geffen is over here. I mean, this is celebrity row. We're sitting like two, like we're probably like three rows from the stage, front, you know, front of the stage. The show goes on. Ted Neely's in. Yeah, we're all excited. It was a great performance. Show ends. Cast comes out. This young kid in the chorus, Michael, because I've been in touch with him, he runs off the stage, like makes a beeline, not to Harrison Ford, not to Gina Davis or anybody else around us. Larry Zerner, you were in Friday the 13th, part three. <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. He so planted him. Yeah, that was a plan. That was all, you've, been, you've been played. Larry's here right now. Come on, Larry, come tell him. <laughs> and it's true. He claims it's not true, but it's true. That's funny. Wow. That's pretty well. All right, Rob. All right, what's your favorite? Uh, well, oh, I, I said uh, four. Four is my four. favorite. But I do, I do have a, a huge affinity for seven as well. Although, watching it again with Elric... It's not as good as I remember. I'm scared to watch it again. <laughs> here's the Here, thing here's with Seven, that the geography is a little weird. Like, there's just people running around the woods. And no, the girl, the girl oh, know where to find puts on the makeup, and then she oh, goes the outside into oh, the woods. That's and you're Andrew's like, yeah. favorite character. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. 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 A little touch-up work my ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I've got flashes of right it to being hilarious, she loves and Andrew. I'm scared to watch it again. Yeah, Like the party horn through the eye and things like that. Well, the thing is, I mean, and we could all delve into our theatrical, our first theatrical Friday, but that was the first one I saw in the movie theater and that was because God, I, I'm old. I, uh, I told uh, I, I had a guidance I was one of the quote unquote troubled kids that had to go see a guidance counselor I think they took him to see Friday oh, yeah. the 13th uh, that's, <laughs> yes I convinced <laughs> I, I was telling Elric this when we went to go see it again last weekend uh, I was in a guidance I, I, I met a guidance counselor and we had a small group of kids I don't know like 10 of us that were like the trouble I or soon to be troubled. I love that you were troubled. So apparently, I just watched horror I was movies. So they thought, I was like severely dyslexic. So yeah. But the point short is, bus was, or no short bus? Not short oh. bus. No, <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was. I was so goddamn excited for Friday Seven coming out because I'd already watched them all. and I'd never seen one on the big screen. Yeah. That I got all the other kids in the group excited, 
and I convinced our guidance counselor, she was like 23 or whatever, nice. I convinced her to take us opening night. <laughs> wow. So her and her boyfriend. It's like my babysitter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Her and her boyfriend met us at the local theater. Nice. And, it was just like, and got oh. you into the R-rated She's film. She's like, yeah, we'll take 12 tickets for Friday 7. <laughs> I like, you know, and it was like, That's a good awesome. thing, though, because like, I did that when I was teaching, because I taught high school before I switched teaching, mm. and I had troubled kids, and I taught film, and yeah, they yeah. gave me some of the more troubled kids because they were like, maybe you can reach them through film. And a lot of them were really into horror. And so we actually, at nice. the time, we went to see a horror movie together. And, you know, it was it was nice. Yeah, so. I, mean, I mean, I had to do that all the time. I know it was because I didn't tell my parents what I was doing. I'd, I'd wait outside a theater and have somebody right. bring, bring me in. But but at the time... were in New York City, right? right. Uh, no, uh, well, Long Island. Long Island. Okay. Yeah, uh, right. Right, right outside of Queens. So nice. I was, I want to say, 12, 11 when that one came out. Mm-hmm. And we all went to... So it's, you know, a bunch of 12-year-olds. But at the time, it was like the greatest theatrical experience in my life to like oh my god he fought this girl and she could move shit <laughs> uh, with her head it's Carrie versus Jason exactly and right. I, I mean I loved it I loved it but yeah. um, but the, one of the things I know I mean when you're 12 you don't know things like oh the MPA cut it or you know what I mean right. like, so to me that was like the goriest craziest most awesome version of Jason it wasn't until we saw it last weekend that I'm like yeah, they really did cut the shit out of this movie. Mm. It's not. It's more noticeable now as oh, an yeah. adult. But yeah. my memory as a kid is it finished. If I don't know. You finished where they left it, off. Yeah, I fill in the blank in right. my own imagination because I had not seen it In a way, maybe that's much. a good thing, though. I don't know. Maybe if that it worked on that level, then maybe that's... Yeah. People yeah. were we're not we're just jaded now because we've seen it all. You know, there's just... The, yeah. they have, I mean, we've seen so many you know, the exploding heads and the, you know, this, the gore has been taken so far. Mm-hmm. It I must sort of appreciate yeah. some of those earlier movies because there were the simplicity of them. And I mean, you know, actually, it kind of bothered me. Kevin Bacon was on the Tonight Show maybe three or four weeks ago. Yeah, and they showed the scene from Private his kill scene from yeah. Friday the Thirteenth, and he kind of mocked it oh. in terms of the effect and how bad he thought it looked. <coughs> like you don't realize that at the time, people were. Completely blown away. That was like a magic trick. No one had ever seen that. Yeah. There's actually, um, we did Gore Zone at the time. There's a couple mm. of um, articles on how they did that mm-hmm. specific scene. I right. mean, that was like a big thing. It was a big thing. I, I still mean, think it, was... it looks better than most effects now. I really do. I mean, yeah. I still yeah. think it It looks like, it still looks like magic in a way. You can work it out now. Right. Whereas you might not have been able to then, but it's right. still, that's so much better than this. But CG to see effect. somebody's yeah. face moving and and, yeah. and watching this arrow come through, I mean, you, people were literally yeah. just blown out of their seats yeah. by seeing this stuff. And I think that was part of the appeal of the movie. It was it was it was Tom Savini's box of magic tricks and how how is it going to be, you know, how was it? How did he do that? Yeah, right? that was a huge part of those early movies. I, I always say that when I defend horror in general, like as a kid, it, you know, it's like. There's so much ingenuity that goes into horror filmmaking, especially because most of it's low budget, that right. I, th- I think for a lot of kids, I probably everybody in this room, that really opened us to filmmaking. Yeah. And we're like, uh, wait a minute, how did you do that? Yeah. And then all of a sudden you understand, oh, wait, people had to make that happen. Right. You know, that's that's how I got an understanding of filmmaking is through horror movies. But Friday in particular, because every kill was just like, holy right. smokes. It was always, yeah. and, and there's an unsung kind of guy. I mean, he's passed away since, but his name was Phil Scuderi. He was one of the three Boston-based investors in the Friday the 13th series. He was really kind of the unspoken, unsung kind of guy, like the creative force. Mm-hmm. All those creative deaths were all his ideas, like the impaling thing in part two, the guy with the, the wheelchair guy with the machete through his head and... That was all Phil. He oh, wow, would, he was like the death dude. He was the death dude. And he would, Ron Kurz, who wrote the script for two, and he also un, did an uncredited rewrite on the first one, but he talked about how, and we interviewed him for our show, he talked about how Phil would get up in the middle of restaurants and act out these death scenes <laughs> and just embarrass the shit out of him. But oh my God. he really was the kind of creative architect mm-hmm. of those early movies. So because that a lot was, of, you know, nobody knows that. That was one of the biggest appeals of Friday the 13th mm-hmm. for me was, and it's, it sounds sick to say, but how are people going to die this time? Cause sure. you, I mean, as Rob said before, it was so very formulaic where you knew exactly what was going to happen right. and who was going to live. Yeah. And, yeah. and <laughs> as soon as somebody had sex, it was like, Oh, well right. they're toast. It's right. just a matter of how they bite it. Mm-hmm. And that's what made the film so exciting for me. But so. Jeff's also give some props to, I think, you know, Certainly Sean Cunningham for the first one. And then Steve Miner, who filled in, I thought, did a great job on parts two and three in terms of his, like he knew how to draw the suspense out before, mm-hmm. and he gave just enough misdirection to not really tip the hat too much. And I think that was a really smart thing. He didn't, and if you remember, if you look at the early Fridays, two and three, and especially even four, you don't see Jason very much. 
Mm-hmm. You see a part of his shoulder. You see, you know, they, he really kind of, they played that kind of Michael like Myers, yeah, you Jaws, play, yeah, you play like John Carpenter. Like yeah. they did that really well. Later, in all the later movies, including the remake, he's just in every frame. So it's, it's just not yeah. scary yeah. anymore. It's really hard to, yeah, when it gets to the space, I can't. I just, don't know. <laughs> I really do. I, I, to be honest, the space one, I didn't, didn't even feel like, like Leprechaun. I, I didn't even feel the like space the space one? film was part of the same world franchise. It I didn't even, it was. just felt like its own. Didn't his mask sort of look like the Mighty Ducks? Yeah, just the scene with the head. In the, the liquid scene. nitrogen, oh, one of my classic. favorite horror scenes ever. And they and they tested that on MythBusters. Did you guys yeah, know? Oh, I loved totally that right. episode. I don't know. Yeah. Funny, I didn't know that. But that scene alone makes the movie. I mean, pretty it much does. the rest of it's like a Venom and, and then I with got Jason. It, and but, you got to give him props for the hologram uh, sleeping bag bash that they oh, yeah. did. Yeah, also yeah. yeah, that was fun. Yeah. I, I mean, I like that one, but that was because it was it was so far removed from the like at that point. The franchise had gone. Jason goes to hell. Like you know, mm-hmm. what I mean, there has been all these di- like it weird left turns. We've gone batshit by and then. Yeah, yeah. So a Let's long space. Yeah, yeah, but but I remember I got it in, the, and I think I could talk about this now. I got it because you remember there were like bootlegs floating right because it was delayed for the longest time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I, I don't remember the specifics. I was talking or trading with somebody on eBay, like somebody that that sold. I think he was an effects artist, and all I remember is at the time I worked at Tower Records, and we'd get a lot of exclusive on Living Dead dolls, mm-hmm. and this guy wanted this one really hard to get Living Dead doll. I'm like, I'll get it for you. What do you got? He's like. Got a VHS of Jason X. <laughs> yes. It's like a year oh, before it came out. out. It never, I mean, you know. Wow, yeah. So, so I was like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah. I want the new Friday the 13th, yeah. <laughs> so we traded it that way. I think he worked on the visual effects, which is how he had an early copy. Right. And I invited. He I was, shall not be named. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't even know who it was at this point. But uh, but yeah, I invited like, like 10, 10 kids from college. I was like, you guys got to come over. I got a new Jason movie. And it's silly and ridiculous but the yeah. idea of like seeing it in my living room right. a movie that nobody could see yet yep. it, like we just had a blast with it I'm wow. sure. yeah, yeah. it, it was, was a great night. experience and, and, and the, I did and that's the thing even though I got a copy of it I did go and pay to see it opening night as well with three other people in the theater but well, the yeah. point is I did support it and pay for it too my, my theater was packed it might have been the only one on the planet there was but yeah and yeah. people wow. were having it were jumping and screaming and it was just a wild it's because I had never seen a Friday movie was that the, the first one that you ever saw that was the first one that I saw in a theater yeah but I still got too that too bad you had to, that's why you're more of a Freddy guy because you started with Jason X <laughs> And I, you I, know, I know, now that you just you broke it down, the reason I like Seven so much is because I saw every other one after that theatrically. So right. it was like, man, it takes. And see, so yeah, I, I just go back a little home. ways even for before <laughs> you guys. But I started with two, and I was way too young for for one. Well, not way too young, but I was a year too young for part one. And and uh, but but you know, of course, there's like that 12 minute recap of part one at the beginning right, of two. Right. So mm-hmm. um, so I think <laughs> I'm I with you. I think minors two and three. I think three I've seen the most. I've seen right. three more what's than. What's your favorite? Because I don't I don't think you know, can get there. Yet. I think it's hard because I think of them as one film. Right. And I'm not kidding. Except yeah. for Jason X for me. Like, right. I really see them. If I could watch any of them any time of night, if it came on, I would just sit there and watch it. It's right. just a continuous It's like, thing. it really is. But yeah. probably, I think probably two, in a part of me would say two is the best because it has the best heroin. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of what you're yeah. saying. I think we really yeah, do it. Steal. You know, people, this idea of uh, killer POV is our title as well, but the idea of identification through a killer's POV is just so raw, off mm-hmm. because you are almost never identifying. You're identifying what they're looking at. Right. So it's kind of a complex thing, but right. she mm-hmm. was so good in right. that film. But number three, I've seen more. I, I honestly think besides The Shining, I think I've seen number three more than any horror film just from sheer rental as a kid. I don't even know if it's because I liked it the most, just because I rented, rented it the most. It. And but I have to ask you the question, how many people have seen it in 3D on a big screen? I've never seen it in 3D. Yeah. That is a oh. completely different never. experience. Totally, totally different, different movie. Yeah, yeah. I'd yeah. love to. I'd you love can to. see what, you know, Harry Manfredini, the composer, is, who actually composed the music for our documentary, which oh, is great. <laughs> unbelievable. That's so cool. It's like his first Real Friday the 13th score in like 15 years. Mm-hmm. Wow. Like I love how you guys do that, by the way, because in Never Sleep Again has that beautiful painted cover, which was the guy that did all the posters Matthew the peak, yeah. He actually, we, we actually hired the original Nightmare on Elm Street mm. artist. The theatrical yeah, one sheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to talk about Harry Manfredini for a yes. sec, whose name I confused with Frank Mancuso That's okay. before. Yeah, they're but, all Italian. Um, Harry Manfredini, because when I was a kid, the way that I was introduced to um, Friday was. I lived in this neighborhood full of all boys and there was probably six guys who lived on my street and me and they used to chase me around making that (laughs) sound. I'd never seen it before, but that was it is they would just, we'd ride bikes and they would chase me around and be like, Jason's going to get you. (laughs) And so mom was like, do you want to see the movie? 
And so my mom actually sat me down and let me watch it. And I think it was probably part three. That sounds about right. I was maybe seven at the time. And so she sat me down and had me watch it. And I was just kind of like, okay. And then after that, most of the boys had never even seen the movie. They just heard about it. And And you had survived it. I became awesome because I saw it. And then from that point on, it really was like a gateway for me because then the next year they were bragging about how everybody had seen Freddy. And my parents would let me watch anything I wanted. You had good parents. Well, the rule was... (laughs) Or at least really cool ones. The rule in my house was as long as I had straight A's, I could watch pretty much anything I wanted. Wow. And so I... And (laughs) even through high school, I mean, I always kept my straight A's just so that I could, you know... And the rule in high school was I did didn't have a curfew as long as I had straight A's. So I never had a curfew either because I always had straight A's. But I mean, it worked because I could watch whatever I wanted. But because of that, I started watching all those horror films and to hell with those boys. Yeah. Showed them. Yeah, you did yeah. show them. I'm Where are they now? now, bitches. If you're listening to this, send us your pathetic Twitter. At least three anything. of them became cops. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's how they're yeah, so But music, just the yeah. music. I mean, long before I even knew what Freddy was when I was seven years old, just mm-hmm. being chased around by these assholes on bikes, it scared the hell out of me. Yep. So just that and iconic it was sound. sound. And what Harry did, he went up to a machine that in the 70s, 80s was what they're called the Echoplex, and it's his voice. And he just went up to it, and, and the, the the line, it's in the movie, it's Betsy Palmer saying, yeah. killer mommy. Killer and mommy. so he went, kick, and then the Echoplex made mama. it repeat, and then mama, and that's how it, yeah. that's how that sounds. I find her born. even creepier when she does that one part in number one where she goes, killer mommy. Oh, it's so it's scary. Just, it's She's creepier. A, you know, what's creepy <laughs> about the first one is it is like a thriller more of, it's more of a whodunit yeah. thriller. Yeah. And when you find out just how twisted <laughs> yeah. this woman is, it's and how far there. she'll go to keep yeah. the camp from ever being reopened because she doesn't want anybody to ever suffer yeah. what she suffered through, thinking that poor Jason, her poor Jason had drowned. Mm. I mean, that was, it was it's a story a, about revenge. I think maybe that's one of the reasons we were talking about the start, why it's, why it has a lasting influence on fans. I think it's because it has one of the best backstories. Yeah. yeah. I think backstories are really important right. to a great and guy. Betsy Freddie Palmer. has a back, great backstory right. too. But. I mean, Betsy she Palmer. is so perfect for that. Yeah. And I remember the first time I ever met her, we were at a Fango convention in New York City. And one of my jobs at the Fango Con, this is when I was first starting out with Fangoria, was I was supposed to be kind of the celebrity liaison and, you know, get cigarettes for so-and-so mm-hmm. and get liquor for so-and-so. And I was getting her like a, a, an eggnog or something like that, <laughs> um, egg cream, because it was New York. And she kept calling me Deary. She was like, thank you, Deary. Thank you, Deary. Hmm. Can you get me this? And it was the creepiest thing ever. Because it's Betsy Palmer. Because it's, it's Betsy Mrs. Palmer voice. calling me Hello, Deary. Dear. Get it, Becca. Get yeah. it. Get it. <laughs> Deary. That'd be crazy. And, 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 and going against the grain, I mean, casting her in that movie was kind of another stroke of genius because she was known as like apple pie. Yeah. You know, she was younger in the 50s, 60s. She was on all the sitcoms and I've Got a Secret and all these shows where she was you know, very wholesome. She's always said she needed a new car and that's why she did it. Exactly. She got $10,000. She went out and bought a new car. And that was, that was she, it. she was pretty foxy as a young woman, yeah, I gotta say. She was. She was <laughs> pretty foxy as Betsy Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys are a little sick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was on, by the way, side story. She was actually also one of the very first interviews we ever did for Icons of Fright. Really? We were starting out wow. like in 2004. And the way we got it, because at that point, like, you know, people were doing email, but not, it wasn't what it is now where like you can, get in touch with anybody. So I went to a chiller convention and just asked her at the, you know, at her table, like, Oh, could I do an interview with you? <laughs> and she's like, yes, Terry. And she just gave me her phone number. I was like, you don't yeah. have email or anything. Cause I don't know, I, that like, is. I'm all nervous, like calling somebody. So I'm like, Oh, can I just email you? She's like, I don't know what that is. I, you just call me. And I remember going to Mike C, my co-creator, and be like, I got Betsy Palmer's number. She's going to do an interview. And he's like, you're the only person that would get excited that a seven-year-old woman gave you her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would have been so excited I would have passed out. That's so. how Larry Cohen still is. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I remember last year trying to get into and he was like, oh, just fax me. I, yeah, fax I don't have yeah, email, so I had to send him. And I'm like, request. okay, and I'm trying to I fax have his it. number here, <laughs> yeah. and I love calling him because yeah, he answers the phone. Hilarious. It's like, it Crispin Glover does, too. <laughs> you can call Crispin. Can we call Crispin live on air? Because that would be... He didn't do the Did show, he? so yeah, I'd love to get an That's interview good. with Crispin. Uh, wow. I've interviewed we, him for Fangoria. I very fascinating. Called, yeah. Very fascinating. We tried a couple of different backdoor routes. I won't no, name sources, but uh, you know, Crispin just never, he just didn't step up, and I'm a little, a little disappointed. Oh, God. That would have been tough to edit. It yeah. would have yeah. been, but I don't care. <laughs> no, it's it worth it. Still he's, been, a great, he's a really yeah. original character. He sure is. This is what kills me, is that my first year out in L.A., uh, I was doing some work for Dread Central, uh, which was the horror channel then. Yeah. Um, I know this story. But uh, uh, he was doing uh, press promotion for his movie, uh, what, what is it? What is it? Yeah. Uh, oh, and, and is that the re- 
retarded. Children. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean that. Sorry, really, but I, no, I, I actually <laughs> kind of enjoy that movie. Everybody it's hates amazing. it, but it's but yeah, it's it's just like being plugged into his brain for ninety minutes. I it's really enjoyed the clowny clown clown movie. Did you see that one? I didn't see the clowny clown clown movie. <laughs> There's some kind of is that clown what it's called? Clown. The clowny clown clown. I gotta movie? find out the God, name, but I think it's he's literally made like it's him with a clown going. What's up, clowny clown clown? Why the frown? It's the clown. It's amazing. That is. Oh God, I got to see this. Now. I think it's on YouTube. But uh, a, yeah, we were we were he was promoting that movie, and so uh, uh, I, you know I, they assigned me go hey go interview Crispin Glover, uh, and so it turns out they had me go to his house with a video camera. Oh my! And I sat down in his living room in the middle of all these books, and me and I think it was Sean Clark who was with me at the time. We did like this hour long interview with him where he talked about that. He talked about Friday the 13th about, 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 the, footage? about the, the, you know, the He's dance dancing. and everything like that, how oh, he was I dancing to ACDC. And, and the second I walked out of that house, my camera just, it didn't explode, but it broke Died. down. Like I heard oh. the grinders go <laughs> and it totally ate up the tape. Wow. And his so, aura did that. Oh, okay, yeah, no, they, they, his, his presence was way too much for that camera to take. Wow. So. He was one of my interviews on Fangoria radio when I was one of the assistant producers on there and, um, D Snyder interviewed him and it was for Beowulf at the time. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and, um, he came on live in person and I remember having a conversation with him about the French fries I was eating. And it was one of these, because I was eating, it was like, there's this place in New York called Better Burger, and they bake their french fries, and nice. we had a conversation about baked french fries, and it was mm. just one of those things where, like, yeah, I talked about french fries with Crispin Glover. <laughs> well, it well it's amazing. a bit more than we talked to him about, because <laughs> yeah. he just wouldn't do it. Well, the punchline of Andrew's I, story actually, yeah. is I, that oh, he, yeah. he edited, instead you edited... Did you edit the dance scene to ACDC? I, I felt so bad, yeah. and and that was I think the first <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah, that was the first time that information had gotten out. So I felt so bad, and I was like, I called up Uncle Creepy. I'm like, God, you fucking, my fucking camera died. And we lost this epic interview with Crispin Glover, but I got a little exclusive that he was dancing to ACDC. So I did do it, did a a back and black edit, yeah, where I laid it in under underneath his dance, and it syncs up. Yeah, it's beautiful. Perfectly. You know, wow. I got to say, yeah. Andrew, you never told me that part. I thought yeah, when, we, when, YouTube, when I we found the lost footage of that dance when we were working on part four for the uh-huh. deluxe edition, the Paramount uh, edition, um, I just thought that was like the first time. I thought Because he, he called me. He's, he was so excited. I found the Crispin Glover dance. I Every found all the of alternate <laughs> footage of <laughs> wow. that dance, yeah. Yeah. which wow. is crazy. Now, than now, what they I, used now to I get it. Now I get why you were all excited. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. It's but unfortunately, YouTube took that off because oh, I guess some a- copyright issues, ACDC raised, raised stunk. Well, so, we got we to get that back up somehow. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's we'll got to go back out. up because it's perfect. He, he was dancing Exclusively perfectly to it. Let's get it up on the website. There you go. Can, <laughs> I, can I ask something about the, uh, the development of Jason from number one to two? Mm-hmm. How much when they were making one, obviously before they know, know it's going to be popular, mm-hmm. had they been thinking about... Obviously, with the great surprise ending, had they been thinking that Jason was going to emerge as a character? After no one. one. Okay, I so think it, it was a honestly a Phil Scuderi notion. Mm-hmm. You know, Sean Cunningham just didn't, and truly, he says it in our show, and he, he says it to me privately in person. He's like, we had no idea about a sequel. No one thought about it. No one talked about it. There was no notion that this would ever happen. And when they came to me with this idea that they were going to make Jason the killer, he was like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my yeah. life. Of course, now he's changed his tune. Is that the only example of that in horror? Savini has said that too, Savini had the same reaction. In fact, Savini's reaction was, well, I'm just going to make this other movie called The Burning and do the effects for that. And that's how he reacted to the idea of Jason being (laughs) the the killer in part two. But like, think about horror. Is is there another example of a sequel going off on that big a tangent from an original original? character? I can't think of it. I don't no, think really. so. I think it was the Anyone only one. That, on. I mean, again, it was the problem was is Mrs. Voorhees was dead, right. and the cast mm-hmm. was dead, except for right. you know Adrian, Adrian King's character, who they you know Jason offs in the first. You know, and I imagine that the ending tested is one. I mean, it's probably one of the best shock endings oh, in yeah. the history yeah. of cinema. Mm-hmm. Still, Even when it comes on now, the anticipation of waiting, waiting for it that that is time. so good. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if that moment alone is enough to go. Oh, what if he grows up? You know, right. and that, that was like a, like sure. A, well, they had the ripples at the end of the, right. at the end of the lake, so they sort of in, are intimating there's something right. in the lake, right? And that was, but, that but was again, like but a, he wasn't. What's what's he doing in the lake? If if he's really been sort of living as this mountain man in the wilderness, you know, with a shack and all, it, <laughs> right. doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. But but uh, whatever. Yeah, whatever. We went with it. <laughs> or are they or are they so saying scared the crap from the very start that he's supernatural without saying that that he was I a supernatural? I don't think they character. ever were. I think yeah. they were really playing it like he was like Bigfoot in a weird way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was the sort of 
you know, I just say mountain man. He had the, remember the shack and the, right. yeah. the altar. And I mean, he, there's something creepy about all of that that just kind of felt real. That like, one was more fetishistic. Like that, that could have happened. You know, this guy could be living out in the woods like that. I think that's why I'm bored with uh, from Manhattan on in the sense that right. that superhuman version right. is a lot less interesting than somebody who's kind of fetishistic but also impossible to understand because he's right. blank. They yeah. tried really to bring that back it. from the remake, and we actually, unlike the book Crystal Lake Memories, we actually do a whole chapter on the remake, and we got cool. a lot of the cast members to come in and talk about you know what what it was and what they intended it to be, and you know, if you were going to make another. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, 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 because they're going to make one, right? Because Paramount got the rights. Yeah, oh, they've so already you, announced yeah. what it. Do you think, what do you think, because you've seen them go to hell, you've seen them go to sleep, yeah. what would you try to bring it back to that kind of origin, original feel, that kind of gritty? Well, I've had my dream Friday the 13th, uh, part 13, in my head forever. And in fact, Frank and I have been talking about so it. So would you do a continuation or a sequel? I would do or, a, sorry, a, a sequel I would or a leave remake. the remake to itself and move on from that. The only thing I'd bring back would be Derek as Jason. Yes. I think he did a terrific job. Yeah. Um, Best thing about that remake in my but opinion. I would, yeah. But, but my, my idea for the sequel or for the ultimate fan sequel is to bring back Amy Steele and Kimberly right. Beck and Dana Kimmel and all the surviving women of Friday the 13th for kind of like, you know, Jason's angels. You know, they go <laughs> after him. The kid, their, their, oh, their college age kids have decided to go party up at Crystal Lake during the winter and... That's cool. Jason's running amok, and the mothers have to band together as a team this copy and go written, after right? them. Yes, it is. <laughs> so it's yes, a bit, it is. It's a bit, it sounds like a bit more like the Freddy origin story, which I like. It's but I think the fans together. would really love to oh, see yeah. those Survivor characters come back for one more kind of Jamie Lee, mm. H2O kind of reunion movie. Yeah. Mm. Friday 13th, Final be Girls. The Final Girls, yeah. yeah the final it girls would be a cool. badass movie. Yeah, and and the winter thing has been talked about a bit. That's yeah, great. yeah, yeah. It's the great. winter it's is like, a mix. No it's it. the only thing they haven't done yeah. at Crystal Lake. I think making yeah. a ski mean, lodge yeah. or something. <laughs> but well, and it's an ice hockey mask, right? So right, right. Snow, right. Well, and you got to have the guy on the ice, yeah. you know, playing hockey, right. and then Jason steps out, and you know he thinks it's his buddy, and you know. yeah. <laughs> that scene. I want to see that. Yeah, yeah, I want to see that high five. You got to. It's been we've been waiting for thirty years for that gag. Yeah. Um, Weirdly enough, the the one everyone hates. I mean, usually it's at the bottom of the ranking list. Uh, Jason goes to hell, but I think the opening of that is just genius. Oh, yeah. I kinda, I kinda he did like a great job. The I, like I love eight. the opening. I don't Adam Marcus, love like, he film, took but. all the cliches of all of Friday the 13th movies and he shoved them into the first 10 minutes mm-hmm. and then yeah. he blew Jason up. It's just so fun and it, and it plays, because, you know, the critics were coming out, you know, people yeah. were writing essays about how it's uh, conservative filmmaking sure. and the punishment and Reaganomics and you're just like, and then that film's opening just like, just makes fun of the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Yes. And then how he does actually it, catch Jason. And then he uh, does the, the, the whole uh, unsafe sex statement where right. the, 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 the couple in the tent and then the, the, the you know, it was, it was, that was the body swapping Jason. So, yeah. But it was the body swapped guy who was walking by and he steps on the condom that they decided not to use and then <laughs> yeah. slices the girl in half. Actually, that was always something that fascinated me was the, the theories that Elric discussed that Jason and was so um, a Republican because it was punishing sin and things like that. Do you guys touch on that? We do touch on the... that a little bit. Not we didn't go I into a whole chapter that, on okay. it, but, but no. there, was, like, there was all of these. Like, oh, that was big. That was a, and it, it was, was huge. A big and it thing. wasn't even That's just confined discussed. to Jason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of went across all slashers, saying that slashers are innately conservative yeah. because mm-hmm. they're publishing or punishing, punishing sex it's your parents and drug use. Yeah. Yeah. Mortal, the mortal sins, and the things you shouldn't be doing. The fifties being expressed through modern day horror films. So, and they were equating it to you know, Reaganomics mm-hmm. in the 80s and everything absolutely. like that. Absolutely, yeah. But this was a predominant theory of the time. Yeah, absolutely was. And we do, it, it, Jeff Katz actually brings that up in the show. And I think it's an interesting road to travel down. I think there should be a documentary Sean, about that. Is Sean like point. that? Any, is there any, when you meet Sean Cunningham, is there any reason to think that he would be You know, like it's that? so funny because Tom Savini has a great quote in the show. He goes, you know, was Sean Cunningham a born again Christian or something? Huh. Because yeah, <laughs> the <interesting. laughs> of sex equals death. <laughs> Um, him apologizing for Last House on Left. I don't maybe. think I don't know <laughs> if that's what it, it, it is. I, I think there's just something about the vulnerability of being, you know, in a in a place where you're either stoned or you are having a good time with your friends or you're having sex with your girlfriend, and the guy walks in and he spears the two of you together. Sex oh, yeah. is a distraction. Yeah. It's a you distraction. Need that. But I think it's the I wouldn't say sexless character that survives. It's the one that sort of sees things a little differently. Yeah. Okay. I don't think vir- virginity is the key. Well, it's I also drugs, it is, right? Is, Non-drugs. Right. Well, there's that, but I think it's also somebody who notices there's more than just, there's more to it than meets the eye. She doesn't belong enough to party. She doesn't belong enough to party, but she also kind of empathizes. Mm-hmm. Favorite right. favorite final girls. Go. Oh, I mean, it's the definitely, series. Yeah, it's definitely Ginny. 
Jenny from Field. part two. Named after the Adrian. production designer, yeah. actually. Her yeah. name was Virginia Field, and Ginny is Ginny Field. So I did have a quick question as we go around to relate it to this, because uh, in a few weeks ago, I remember when I said we were watching number three with uh, Matt Curry Holmes, and we were watching it, and we're like <laughs> quarter of the way through, and just I yell did out. Did talk the I don't entire know time? Well, we were drinking, and I just yelled <laughs> out, wait, let's download the script, and let's read it aloud before it happens. <laughs> nice. So we started, there was three of us, and we started reading each line and description before right. it would happen, and it was like probably the most fun I've ever had watching that <laughs> You know, actually, a couple years ago at um, Cine Family, they did a screening of Part Three, not in 3D, but they did a screening. It was like Mystery Science Theater, oh, yeah. and it was Larry Zerner and a couple comics, and they just sat there and they just roasted the movie all the way through. And they, all the death scenes, they would pause them and play them back like ten times in oh, a row. Oh, that's fun! It was but but we got to um, we got to about the ninety percent mark. And, and the, the script, script ended, d- and we our jaws dropped, and the, it just says, "From here on, the script was not used." And we're like, "What the?" And you want to know what? I have the script that so was So why wow. does it end? I do well, have there it. There was an understand. actual script. Yes, there was. Did they okay. just improvise the ending? Or no, was okay. no, there was scripted. Um, actually, what happened was it was um, the script for part three was written by a guy named Martin Gutrasser and his wife, Carol Watson. And Marty um, is actually today, he's the script supervisor on all Quentin Tarantino's movies. Hmm. Um and he was, and Marty was the the script supervisor on part one and two. Mm. And it was kind of oh. everybody in the in the Friday Thirteenth universe, especially in the first few movies, was always like promoted promoted from within. Mm. You know, you start from the script supervisor, now you're writing the next movie. So that's what that's happened nice. with part three. Um, but the script needed a little doctoring. So a guy who ended up not taking a credit, his name was Petru Papescu. Mm. He did an uncredited rewrite. Um, it's a Romanian writer, mostly a novelist, and actually we interviewed him. For the show, you're so. great with names, by the way. Oh my gosh. You just like are fired. Oh, well, you know, I've been living, I've been living this nightmare for a little while. But uh, but uh, so is that why the other one ends? Because well, it there wasn't was an ending. And, but but I think Petri came in and he did uh, he did a pass. And the original ending, which I have to say, because Andrew and I didn't get to work on part three for the the Blu-ray for Paramount, it's the one thing that I think if we got into those archives, we would find that footage. I just want to believe that it's mm. there. Um, but there was an alternate ending shot. There are some stills of it that exist. Mm-hmm. And instead of, um, you know, they kind of cop the ending from number one and not in a very good, mm-hmm. effective way mm-hmm. with like Mrs. Voorhees jumping out of the lake and pulling her under. Um, in the original ending, it was it was a bigger dream sequence and she ran to the barn and found all of her friends dead in the barn. Like it was like the cops had come and said, nothing happened here. We didn't mm-hmm. see anything. There were no bodies. She finds the bodies, and as she's running back in to tell the cops, she opens the door. Jason's standing in the door, and he hacks her head off. Oh, nice. And that was the ending. Oh, that they shot great. that ending, and the reason they end up, I think it's in the show, the reason they ended up reshooting it was they didn't like Stan Winston's Jason design because he was maskless at that time. Uh-huh. At that oh. point. They didn't like the face. Oh, so that's wow. why they reshot the ending. But I don't know why they changed it as much as they yeah. did. Yeah. I mean, it was a drastic change. It's really just the first. It was kind of a yeah. punch out ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's really interesting. I yeah. mean, see, that's when you get to answer. This is why, for people out there who don't understand I'll why send we you podcast. The last, I'll send you the last <laughs> 10 pages of the script. Yeah, this is read. the reason we podcast, because right. you, you come across something that you just cannot solve, right. or, and you're too lazy to Google. Uh. <laughs> and you wait, you wait weeks and weeks until someone comes into your orbit yeah. and, and answers your question. You right. I love that. Going yeah. on. But that was the original ending of three. That's really fantastic. Wow. wow. Rebecca, final girl out of the series. I was a big Adrian King fan. Yeah. So I got to stay with it. Stay with the original. I just bought some of her wine. Oh, yeah. She, she makes uh, wine. She yeah, makes Oregon. Crystal Lake wine. Yeah. She and her husband wow. own a winery up in Oregon, where they live, and right next to Bruce Campbell. By the way, yes, they're Bruce, Bruce Campbell's Campbell, their neighbor. You know, I interviewed him once, and yeah. um, this was not once. I've interviewed him a bunch of times, but a couple of years ago. But and, one of um, the times you interviewed. One him. of the times I interviewed him, and somehow I was putting on hand lotion. And he was like, "That's lavender scent." You know, I own a lavender farm, <laughs> and I was like, "Are you fucking serious?" And he was like, "Oh no, I own a lavender farm." Do you know who buys my lavender and turns it into oil? Stephen Seagal. And <laughs> I was like. Did oh everyone God. have name like a drop. side project? Nine, name so drop. Um, that would be his farm in Oregon. He, yeah, that's he right. runs well, a Well, next door farm. to that is the King, Adrian King and her husband Richard. Uh, they own a, 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 a vineyard. And uh, she's put a Crystal Lake Wines label out. Wow. Um, huh. what, what, yeah. what, what, what are some of the names? There's some great names. Um I don't know, like Survivor's Cabernet or yeah, something, something like that. There's some great names. names. We, gotta, we gotta look it up because I, I'm gonna kill myself if I don't. You know, if I don't. And uh, apparently, there I learned from Coppola. There's good money to be made in the wine yes, business. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I but, must. But, but especially if your name's Coppola. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. that didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. <laughs> For sure, Andrew. Andrew, yeah. Favorite final girl. Yeah. In the Friday. Hmm. 
Stu Charno. Uh, <laughs> oh, what? Nice. But he did Good. live. He, he lived. He, 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 did. he, got, he did. gets so drunk, he disappears from the movie. I know. That's pretty awesome. That's great, Andrew. I wouldn't have thought of that one. There That's was a, great. There was a, uh, Fango, uh, at a Fango convention, there was like a Friday panel. I have a picture of this. It was like a director's panel, and in the middle of it, Stu Charno jumped up on stage and pointed to a shirt that said, I'm still alive. Did he bust out a ukulele? No. Oh. That would be he much more of like us. an Ari really? thing. Really? That's amazing. Oh, really? Now, did Ari play music in your um, documentary? He didn't, actually. No, he didn't do the whole first Jason shtick. He's still Chicago based, right? Yes. I met him in a video store a couple times, and he led with, came and didn't know, I didn't recognize him. This is years ago. He led with first words out of his mouth was, hey, you know, I was the kid from, from Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. And I was like, oh, wow. He actually emailed me um, a couple weeks ago just asking, did I make it in the show? You know, yeah, I think like, he's pretty yes, excited about it. He's very yeah. enthusiastic. No, it's great. All right, Dan, you're on. Oh, uh, Final girl. Uh, Amy Steele for sure. Wow. Yeah, yeah Ginny. Oh, there's high yeah. fives going across high the fives. table. She's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get controversial, but uh-oh. I'm going to say Pam from Part 5. All right. Ooh, wow. I'm saying, oh, she's a huge it's Jesus Christ fun. Superstar fan. Really? <laughs> huge. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm, I'm going to see the movie with her on Monday. Wow. Her eyes. And her, you know what she told me? My she, eyes are she clear called, right now. She, yeah, yes. She, <laughs> she called me the other day, and she, she says... She, and I had no idea. She, she had never met Ted Neely, who I have known for about 20 years now. And she's like, my one, the wizards, and there's only one person that I've ever wanted to meet in my life, and it's him. It's wow. Like, so wow. I said, I'll introduce you. Nice. <laughs> but uh, so I'm going to see uh, Superstar with. We must talk Bam. after the show. We should. I've been in that twice, and I directed it once. Really? Yeah. I did, we did it in high school, too. So that was uh, at Santa Rosa High School. College, and then a couple theaters in DC. Nice. So. Who did what? you play? Judas. And then I was female <laughs> Judas. That's I awesome. was Judas the second time. The Sweet. first time that's I a, was that's a um, big ass role. Second time I was one of Harrod's girls. You must have. She's got a. Come on, we're still filming. Now you guys so sing. You know what? Sing, 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 sing. Please stop it now. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I do want to hear. I do want to hear. This is so geeky stuff. So she, after the show, no, we gotta sing one Elric line. Elric will call me the sallow of people again. She's the sallow of people. Just sing one line. Have it on their minds. One one bar. Uh, my mind is clearer now. That's not safe. I know, I know. <laughs> Alvin's going to like beat me. Uh, I, I, I am going to go into a verse of God's spell quickly. Please do. Just day because day. it's day. <laughs> day by day. Superstar was a better one, though. That was some preachy. So we're all musical yeah, theater geeks, too. Yeah, totally. I'm not. <laughs> Let me stay for I'm not either. I am not, not a musical not. theater. Yeah. I'm not, I do not like musical theater. I don't Or either. dancing. I truly hate yeah. musical theater, but oh I just God. like that. I'm I just such like an that. addict. I yeah, love not, musical theater. I, don't like, I still listen to it in my car all the time, too. Larry, like, Larry Zerner is the gayest straight man I've ever met oh because he loves <laughs> musical theater. I <laughs> shouldn't Bye. admit that. I'll like go watch Guinea Pig part like five through nine. Actually, they didn't make that many. Like one through four. Guinea Pig? And then a, Guinea Pig. This is a different podcast. It's like Japanese. I have no idea what you're even talking about. films. And then I'll get in my car and like sing along to music man right, i'm gonna so. change the topic all right here we go <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do musical uh, no, i do want to know musical uh, theater I, i'm curious before we finish i uh, we on uh, jason i was curious in general what are your favorite uh, horror documentaries okay. just because oh, i mean yeah, and this one. could be even extra features or yeah i remember loving the joe spinell story for for instance which was just on the end a of a mania, disc a yeah. and i probably never would have seen it but uh, you know the one i actually have to give a huge shout out to and it's probably the one that gave us a little bit of confidence to pursue what mm-hmm. we did for never sleep again in terms of sheer volume is the shark is still working oh, oh yeah. hell yeah that's great. That what an amazing job michael roddy yeah, yeah 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 i mean they and we we were actually in touch with them during because they, 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 I just felt bad. You know, they, they'd spent so much time, so many years, and a lot of money. And it took so long to get to get it out. And yeah. it's just they just could not make it happen. I'm glad it finally ended up on the Blu-ray. Yeah. But um, but that was really the one I remember seeing. And we were talking a lot about that at mm-hmm. the time yeah. about just the fact that they did something so bold. Mm. You know? I was talking. Yeah, I was talking to them when I started Psycho Legacy mm-hmm. simultaneously, along with Paul Davis, who did the, uh, uh, Elm, Elm Street. Mainly I mean, because I mean, the, uh, Werewolf. So. Mainly because the three of us were like doing. We were all doing Universal properties as fans. And right. We're like, what did they tell you? And right. It's like, well, you know, and they also try to scare the shit out of you with these yeah, licensing, yeah. you know, departments. I mean, of, course, of course, their job is to make money for the studio, and you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you gotta, you gotta kind of work with them. And, and this it's, it's it's the it's the necessary evil. Yeah, <laughs> but and, actually, we've been and, and, we've been you know we've gotten I wouldn't say we've gotten support from Warner Brothers or or Paramount on on these shows or particularly Warner Brothers on Never Sleep Again. There was a time actually they were interested in acquiring that, 
um, which didn't happen for a variety of reasons. But but actually, I think they appreciate these things in their own way because it does help keep their franchises alive. Yeah. You know, oh, oh, they, if they don't understand that now, yeah. Yeah. they're dead. Back yeah, then, yeah, I get yeah, it. Like yeah. 10, 15 years ago. Right. That's why I think often those early ones were really interesting because they were treated more like films. And right. They would have been a lot harder. And they came more left field. Back then, it was harder to find a documentary mm-hmm. that introduced you to new horror films. That's why I loved that stuff. Yeah. Now, it's, you know, everyone has yeah. to do it as yeah. part of a Everybody film. Everybody has right. one. But, right. you know, usually those, there's a film that it's almost, it's really hard. It's really unfortunate to see, but it's called Demon Lover Diary. Okay. And it's a documentary that would be like, basically like a behind the scenes mm-hmm. of a film now, but back when you didn't do that for a movie. Right. And they're making this indie film called, I think it was called Demon Lover, the actual film. I've never seen the actual film. Right. But it was a two-person documentary career from like 1984. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've only seen a bootleg, like to the point where the picture was so bad. Right. But it was one of the funniest. It was basically American movie, mm. but for real. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, American movie's kind of real, I guess. Um, American <laughs> movie, but on a it horror is. set. Right. Uh, and these people were like, you know, they're going through conversations like, well, how are we going to shoot this scene? And like, let's sell the car just so we can get the next scene. So suddenly now there's no production vehicle. And this this couple who are filming it, it's just like so riveting. And right. I'd never seen anything like that, you know, at that point. But I also thought uh, one I really liked was uh, Joe Madry, a guy we all know. Nightmares in Red, White, and Blue. Sure, yeah, yeah, it's a great job. Yeah. Because it yeah. took a real viewpoint yeah. about yeah. what the, horror the, meant in a social context. context. Yeah. And yeah. I really, I thought it was just a really yeah. great yeah, narrative. Yeah, well done. You know, and, um, Adam Simon, who who oh, yeah. wrote of Hunter course. Connecticut, and you know he's done his retrospectives and, and things like that, and, and sort of political, mm-hmm. politically themed, I think horror docs. Oh yeah, the American um, Nightmares. That American was Nightmare. going to be one of mine. Yeah. I loved yeah. that one. That was one yep. that really kind of um, I loved the perspective on violence in mm-hmm. that because it really did give it a perspective, Absolutely. and it was one of the first times that it did the violence of the '70s yep. and how it was equated into film. That was kind of the first time I saw it. Yep. You know, really kind of. Mm-hmm. Well, it helps you make re- we realize that these films are important. That we're not weirdos for liking them. Right. That these films, well, we are, but we it's are. Okay. But, but just like criminals, they're, they're, they're you need your boundaries, numbers. right? Yeah. <laughs> you need to know how far you can go in this world. Right, right. Yeah. And I yeah. think yeah. horror shows us the, that. The, there is, there's, it's, an, there's an art form behind it, mm-hmm. and I think few people outside of the genre want to recognize that, especially when right. a movie like Silence of the Lambs wins, you know, yeah. Best Picture Award, yeah. which is without a doubt a horror film yeah, yeah. a smart one a well made one calls but it a, a horror thriller. a thriller yeah. it's just it's that, a that, that sort of trying to distance yourself from that sort of horror ghetto I guess we'll call it mm. right um, well through casting right. Right. yeah it's a big part of that right <laughs> that by casting help. A-list people well, you yeah can. but I think that it, it proved that it's such a, a viable genre and um, I think all these years later that it's you know there's just room for more now. I think we're mm-hmm. just like waiting for that next thing that's going to sort of... Mm-hmm. Well, there's always the room for some smart filmmaking. That's the mm-hmm. problem. Yeah. Sometimes with horror is it attracts dumb filmmaking because right. of the and generic I've seen element. a lot of that. dumb yeah. horror documentaries, but one of my favorites was um, Chris Garantano's um, Horror Business. Oh, I'm glad you brought that I up. Seen I really that. liked I that one. That it was mm-hmm. focused on um, small indie horror filmmaking, and it was much more... Instead of being about the business or, you know, the political side of it, it's much more about the passion mm-hmm. about it, and it's just... It interviews... Kind of guys like American movie. But He's in it. Mark Burchard's in it. Oh, yeah, cool. Mark Burchard's in it. It's an unofficial, it. like, those portions could be considered a sequel. Mm. But yeah. it's, yeah. But it's, it's more about, like, there are, because Chris is one of my best friends from New, New York. Island. Yeah, yeah. he spoke in my class when I taught. I love him. Yeah, and I went, I went with him to show that film around. Uh, we went to Austin and stuff like that. It's really good because... It's he's got guys like George Romero and Herschel Gordon Lewis pop up for a couple of minutes just to say how, you know, you know, talk about independent filmmaking. But it's like these five guys, Mark Burchard included, that are just so on the outskirts and mm-hmm. that represent ninety nine point nine percent of the people trying to make horror movies. Yeah. And they weren't, what I really liked about his film is the people that he was documenting. It wasn't like, here's a, like American movie is like, here's a couple guys trying to make really gory movies. Mm. But he also had that one guy whose name is escaping me, but it, it was the guy giving birth in the bathroom was the scene of the movie that he showed. Oh, da- uh, David Stignaria. David Stignaria. <laughs> yeah. That's it. And his film was very artistic. So this it showed good. the indie side of making these artistic films mm-hmm. that weren't just like, yeah, I like zombies. I want to shoot some in my backyard. It was these very artistic films that people were making out of passion mm, yeah. and I loved that element of it and David Stignaria actually gave me that film and it's, yeah. it's really quite catharsis. poetic catharsis I have it, that's I have it, it. Yeah. Is it I've got like a burner is this, copy it's uh, uh, well horror business definitely is image put it out right? yeah. uh, right, right, and, okay, and there cool. were periods where it was on Netflix and so I don't know if it is now catharsis I don't think is available I'm happy to loan you my yeah. copy oh, oh, it's really quite like beautiful it highlights like something we talked about with the gesture tracking I think the VHS one is that it's often and I'm sure you found that in your show and I bet when we watch it, we'll see often the best stories 
are not the celebrities. It's not the big right. names. Mm-hmm. It's the people who you don't know about who are just so in it. Sure. And their stories come from much more. I don't know. I, we found that in a lot of things yeah. we've been yeah. discussing. Right, 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 and right, yeah. this year, my favorite horror documentary wasn't even focused on the industry. It's the one that played at Screamfest. Um, why is the name escaping me? American Haunts? And it focused in uh, on the, the, the American by the guy who made Best American Worst Scream, Movie. Thank you. Yeah. And no, and it focused on the at home haunters. Yeah. Oh. And again, the passion. I mean, and these yeah. were just guys who, you know, have normal day jobs and live in suburbia, but they turn their homes into these magnificent haunt. Right. Mag- so they're like the Bob Burns of their exactly. right, yeah, neighborhood. Except yeah. they're just, you know, in these, I think it was mostly in Northwest. So they oh, were cool. like in Connecticut and Massachusetts area. That's a great idea. Area. Yeah, that's really cool. And um, it focused on them. And it was just I, like, I, I honestly, I teared up during a couple of scenes wow. where they yeah, were talking about it's how great. much passion they had for these yeah. things. I was just like, man, I feel that same way yeah. about Halloween. And I don't even know why, but I equate with these people. Mm-hmm. Brilliant documentary. Cool. Yeah. Loved it. I, th- I think if you're going to talk about like making of documentaries, I think the undisputed king is Charles Lazarica. Uh, the, the stuff that he does for Fox, particularly the alien documentaries oh that he did oh, for that yeah. Blu-ray yeah. set, where they're like three or four hours dedicated Unreal, per yeah. movie, yeah. Yeah. and they cover mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he, he does all of Ridley Scott's stuff now, right? He did, yeah. and he, mm-hmm. he did one on Prometheus that was incredible yeah. for Blu-ray, and it's like a five- or six-hour mm. documentary just on Prometheus, yeah. and you yeah. learn every little thing about that Wow, movie. I need to watch that, because yeah. I really like Prometheus. Very few people I, did, I, but I, I wanted I, I to did, know the backstory. Yeah, I enjoyed Prometheus too. What's, but I what's saw amazing it with is, you. yeah, you did. I was like sitting next to you. Okay. <laughs> no, I think they're saying in the water because everyone that screening liked it. Brad, Brad, Miska, me, you, all these people Brad from different. Liked it? Yeah, he loved it when we all watched it yeah, together. I remember but us after all that, no one liked it. Parking lot. I did. Well, yeah. No one liked it. After. <laughs> We're just I'm like this. Parking lot afterwards, talking about how we liked it. Dad didn't. Were you at the screening at the Fox lot with all of us? No, I didn't go to the Fox lot. Fox lot. No, we saw a different cut than you guys. Yeah. Well, you just liked it because you were on the Fox lot. Yeah. Had to be yeah. But that's they, the crazy thing is like even <laughs> you watch this documentary and you watch those those deleted scenes and it's like all the problems that people had with the movie were talked about or addressed or were cut out of the film. You know, yeah, and so you come yeah. away with this whole new perspective. On, yeah, but that's on, not what was in the movie. So you can I, only judge it on the movie. Yeah. It's a good movie. Oh, but, but yeah, this, is, this is another podcast in yes. itself. Yeah. The Prometheus episode. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, on, on top of that, there's the, of course, there's, you've got the Werner Herzog documentaries, like My Best Fiend and mm. Brighton oh, of Dreams. Yeah. Right. And, and those are insane if, you, if you're a big cinema lover and you want to see the most insane crazy go-to-war conditions you could possibly imagine. Yeah, Burden of Dreams is yeah. probably just the best filmmaking documentary in the history of cinema because it just shows the dream of making film in alignment with actually the character's dream of yeah, getting a boat right. over hill. And people right. die. I mean, people are trying to get a boat up, and there's people, Indians, dying for some <laughs> filmmaker's passion project. It, it's just one of those very strange What was the experience? The Man of La Mancha documentary. Oh, yeah, Lost in La Mancha. Lost in yeah, La Mancha. That's, that's interesting, that's too. Terry I really Gilliam. liked that one. And I also have to, um, since we're talking about film documentaries, I really like Trekkies just because it yeah, focused yeah. Oh, much yeah. more yeah, right. on the, the fan side of it. Sure. Than, um, and again, so that we came at a time when these things weren't kind of as common as they are now. Yeah. So they were like taking a gamble with something like, like that. I always talked about making the fan version of Trekkies in the horror right. industry, like going into, you know, the people who are really like diehard fans. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, there's, there's kind one, of like uh, us, but not, you know, no. there's that one called fan, uh, more fan colorful Tasm. analysis. Phantasm. Oh, that's on the that, way. Uh, yeah. That, uh, Justin uh, Beams like, in that. Yeah. Yeah. One of our listeners, Kyle, I can't He's remember. Written to us I'm sorry, Kyle, but I'm looking forward to your doc. Yeah. I, I'm anxious to see that one. I know that they shot some at Rock and Shock last year and right used a couple of fans. Didn't Bruce boys. Campbell make a fan film fan, back yeah, in the day? Yeah, it's Finalis. Finalis. Yeah. Finalis. I think it's on one of the Evil Dead releases. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I'm sure he had an interesting I'm also excited that almost 50% of this room has seen my documentary, Psycho Legacy. So of thank course. you. Of course. Thank you to the right yeah. side of the we table. Gotta, <laughs> we got to give a not, shout not, out to yeah. Psycho not, Legacy. Not my co host, neither of which you guys have seen it. What? What is wrong with you? I just feel like that might be too much. Like it might tip the power scale of the room if we see it and then i'm actually how about like, we watch it together we need to Can we watch it together let's right. just have a screening all right it's we'll not four it. hours long you don't no. have an excuse yeah i mean i've, I've watched <laughs> yeah exactly if you made it through uh, never sleep again you got uh, it and how long i'll is watch it on youtube so right now like i'm watching it now like here we go. I it was about 90, 90 brian's minutes. seen it our board op has seen it <laughs> thank you brian <laughs> <laughs> somebody knows nice. what i do for a living we promise. We, hey, uh, let's not miss before we skip to news and stuff. Let's not miss uh, release dates and how people are going to see this. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. What is the plan? I okay, so it. I got to Yeah. Okay. I so here, am I getting it? Okay, you <laughs> you are going to get it, but there's been a slight shift in the release plan. Not so bad. 
Okay. It's never good to hear we have to bump a release, but it's for actually it's a very a cool good date. reason. It's a cool date. So originally we were slated for August 27th. Mm-hmm. We have decided for a couple of reasons, and I'll explain why, to bump it to Friday the 13th, September 13th. Nice. Uh, why on earth would you do why that? Why would we do that? <laughs> <laughs> know, the most well, logical possible scenario. <laughs> for a and the reason for that was, you know, we actually came um, to the... Uh, the, the, con- the conclusion that we really wanted to put subtitles on this this one. We weren't able to do it for Never Sleep Again um, right away. We had we came up with like a second edition of that um, because we needed to market it in a slightly different way, what have you. Um, but anyway, with this one, we really wanted subtitles. But we also realized that there's a big Lat- Latino audience for the Friday the 13th movies. Which and I we were love. Getting, yeah, and we were getting a lot of requests. So we thought, you know, let's take let's find out what it'll take to do it. And we actually found uh, it was a fan who had actually transcribed all of Never... I don't even know if you know this, Andrew. Transcribed the entire four hours of Never Sleep Again into Spanish. What? And made his own subtitles. Oh, my God. And he came to us and he volunteered to, to transcribe in Spanish the entire seven hours <laughs> oh of Crystal Lake Memories. That is ridiculous dedication. And yes, indeed. So we, how could we refuse that offer? I don't so like anybody that much. That is amazing. I know. There aren't a lot of Latino so, characters yeah. in horror films, though, no, are there? Not, no, or but, not in the 80s. No, now there might. No, there were... It'd well, be, there was there was Vera Sanchez in part three. Uh, it would be a <laughs> smart one. move. <laughs> Shelley's Huge girlfriend. audience growing. Shelley's yeah. blind date. Um, but anyway, you know, for that reason, and not because we were taking advantage of this very kind-hearted fan, Jose, um, but uh, we really wanted to kind of do the complete thing, and we figured if even if, it, if it's a couple weeks more, we certainly wouldn't have stretched it a month or more. than If that had come down to that kind of a thing, we, we, we would have vetoed it. But we just thought in the interest of making it the definitive so we don't have to go down the road and it's like, oh, now you can get the version with the Spanish subtitles. We'd rather do it now, mm-hmm. get that over with, and you push the, relate, the release date. And it just made sense there's a Friday the 13th calendar, uh, on the calendar. So That's it great. all kind of made sense. It's it's never the fun thing. I'm sure there's going to be those fans that are pissed off at us, but I'm sorry. It's but only you'll a get the weeks. show. Yeah, it's only a couple you'll, weeks. You'll get it on Friday yeah, yeah. 13th. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're planning a, uh, an event at Dark Dells here in L.A. or in Burbank. Nice. Um, there'll be a bunch of Friday the 13th, you know, Stars and us uh, signing Blu-rays. Um, What's this? We don't I, have the date yet. We're going to plan it sometime in September. We're kind of still pushing for the thirteenth mm-hmm. to like to actually have it like day and date with the release. So it'll be like the evening of Friday the thirteenth, um, September thirteenth at Dark Dells. Not officially confirmed yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, I already pre-ordered it, and nice. uh, I'm looking Ooh. at the flyer here. And if you pre-order it, you get a bonus disc. You so, do. What's this you bonus do. disc that I can look forward to? What's what's on that? I just turned that in uh, yesterday. That's, that's <laughs> it's, it's on Andrew's computer right Andrew now. Andrew dancing uh, with Crispin Glover <laughs> as a screensaver. I want it to be that's just Andrew's egg. cat, Frodo, yeah. just like, <laughs> right. walking around the house. Oh, Frodo. This is your bonus bonus. I, I, yeah. I, I, I put the, the footage of the dog from part four jumping out of the window on the roof for five <laughs> hours. <laughs> it's it's going to be that great. The that's the bonus. <laughs> Gordon, what happened to Gordon? <laughs> now, there's, there's about four, I think over four hours of bonus features of just extended interview clips, stuff mm-hmm. that hit the cutting room right. floor. And a couple of last minute interviews that we ended up getting, which didn't make the main show because they came in so late, but they they made it to the bonus disc, which is kind of cool. You know, we have not seen Andrew for weeks. I have to say, like, Andrew hangs out with us a lot of the time, and we have not seen him for weeks, and I now know why. Yeah. He's fashion Keeping him prisoner. And now that we're on the topic, we've been waiting. How many episodes have we had? It's our 24th episode. It's our 24th episode. It's it's time for the origin story. This is it. This is it. I thought everybody was going to get naked. So often, I assume, podcasts are often groups of friends or whatever who just get together and start something. In this case, the three of us who you've been listening to, who whether you think we're a good chemistry or whatever, it all comes down to one man who was in this room, Andrew, Andrew Cash. Cash. Andrew, yeah. How did this begin? Because because I knew I knew Rebecca a little bit, I but I like, never met Elric until, and I actually didn't want to talk wait, to him. Wait, I have to give Brian episode. credit too because Brian had to ask him the question. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> Brian, otherwise Brian's going to give me stink eye. Yeah. <laughs> I met Rob vaguely in line at something at the New Bev. What were we waiting in line for? It was like some Psycho type of two. This isn't story. your story. This <laughs> is Andrew <laughs> Cash's <laughs> story. It's, it's a very Cash epic and epic and long important story. He's always bringing. Oh my God! In a time. Time before Killer POV, <laughs> one man ready? had a vision <laughs> in a world, in a world, in a world. The, 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 the super exciting, thrilling story <laughs> of the origins of uh, Killer POV was I was here doing some uh, work for Brian and uh, Brian stuck his head out of the office and said, hey, uh, 
Sorry, that's the worst impression of you. <laughs> he just turned off our podcast. Yeah, the lights have gone dark. Canceled. Canceled. We're done. <laughs> but he sticks his head out and says, "Hey, I'm thinking about putting together a horror podcast. Uh, who should uh, Who should do it?" And uh, I just set up a dartboard with some names on it. And no, no we I just were a dartboard. Oh, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, not no. at all. You were the first three names that came to mind, and uh, it um, just works. Yeah, it and it's just so surprising because we got emails all from him saying the same thing, saying, oh, "I gave him these three names." And I hadn't met Rob. Rob hadn't met me. Weird. I knew, oh, I thought I you guys are all like we had never met. And I've met a lot of Elric people, for a yeah. couple of months, but I'd never yeah. met Rob. Oh, funny. Like Rob and I knew each other vaguely. Yeah, but. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, well, if Elric's doing the show, then I want to be paid for I wrote to them saying, no, yeah. anyone else, just Elric. <laughs> <laughs> just wanting the Elric show. And I'd been a guest on one of the prior shows here, but I didn't. What do you mean yeah. you had, wait a minute, Becca just told the biggest lie ever. No, and has, I have. Becca has, has to lie every episode. This is the episode. She goes, she's the same. <laughs> like, no, you just said that you'd known me for a couple months. We had done th- two seasons of Inside <laughs> Hard again. <laughs> as the <laughs> news girl, you would say. Okay, okay. But we got a caller on this shit. Because she's got a time... <laughs> It's been a, a couple. It hadn't problem. been like a full year yet. Okay. Well. Okay. That's that's fair. But I'm see, just saying you're see, making it sound like we've like, met. No. 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 <laughs> we'd been working together, okay, but okay. it had not been a full year. So uh, rather than say we'd known each other for a okay. year, I said a couple. Okay. Of you're making it sound more dramatic. Ass. I'm coming for you now, Fibber. Kate. I'm Fibber coming Nachi. for you. Wow. <laughs> My God. That's true. We did. after you, Kate. I saw Andrew at Scary Yogi, our version of karaoke, earlier this week, and I was like, Hey, you're on our show this week. We're going to talk about the origin story. And right then he's like. Oh, you mean when Brian asked me who should host the show? And I was like, oh, Rebecca, Elric, and Rob. And I was like, that's the whole story? And it's like, no, we got to think of something way more. <laughs> Some <laughs> epic, epic thing. But like, it's rare. I think it's rare that all that it zombie, works out. We couldn't, so we got Rob G. Uh, yeah. uh-huh. Thanks. Much right better, then. much better. Yeah. But I, I do think genuinely it's surprising that it worked out, because in the first meeting, I wouldn't have known. We were all sitting in a room. We're just talking with right Brian here. about ideas. Yeah. Well, I will say I for having not been part of this before tonight, which has been very fun. You guys have great chemistry together. Oh, Thanks, thank you. you. you guys so we're kind of like awesome friends now. Yeah. Like, we need best friends bracelets or something. Yeah. yeah. No Can't one else agrees Let's with me Let's sing Jesus Christ Superstar again. Because <laughs> <laughs> I much prefer that part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the great thing is, is I, uh, Elric also named a sandwich after I did. Me I named a sandwich. Jump Cut Cafe. And Dave uh, got angry because I didn't get it today. I took him takeout today. It's good. And What's he was like, why didn't you get the cash? And I was like, because I got the hot chicken instead, but it was cold by the time I got the hot chicken. Pretty sandwich? damn good. You gotta hit the, the big, big, big jam. You gotta hit the big jam. Big jam. Big, big jam. Big jam. Is where it's he's at. A, he's, right. a, he's an expensive guy. So uh, he was who's meeting me at the yeah, jump cut for a uh, little uh, for a cash big jam cash. tomorrow. Come, come, come by and eat me. <laughs> 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 that should be on your bumper. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, any quick news headlines? Because I know we've been on. No, no. Oh, there's nothing. So nothing's happened in the world of horror. Um, I finally saw The Conjuring. I just wanted to say that. Did you like it? I loved it. Okay, good. Because it was like my favorite film so far this year, next to Stoker. I loved everything about it. That would have been a deal breaker. It was amazing. I loved that movie. Have you guys seen it yet? Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Dan? <laughs> Dan's uh, making the Dan, he's making the don't face. ask me face. Remember at the start of the show he said there's a couple things he didn't want to get into? That was it. No, no, no. He's pleading the fifth. Well, well here's the, the thing. It might, like, the problem is I know the real people. I, I've known the Amityville story. I've been a part of it. Oh, I knew the real true. family. So wait, I knew the Warrens. Know the Warrens. I know the Warrens. Well, Ed has passed away, but I know Lorraine very well. Mm-hmm. I have been in the basement alone <gasps> with Annabelle Were you in at the night. And everything? Ooh. I it doesn't what they did in the movie is nothing compared to the real thing, so it just was silly to me. You should make a documentary that doll is not about scary. the Warrens. They're fascinating. Absolutely, yeah. It's, well, it's the, such I, a fascinating thing. I interviewed thing. them twice. Well, I interviewed Ed before he passed away. For when we, I did a documentary on the Amityville story about mm-hmm. 12 years ago for His- History Channel. Uh-huh. So I got the Lutzes. That was their last interview uh, together. Um, which is it's in that box set of the three movies yes which right. is great yeah, all yeah, the, yeah, all thanks. History yeah. Channel it was stuff. my first documentary so it was weird that that was sort of like the launching pad maybe in a weird way for, for all of this stuff that we've been doing but um, but then when we did Haunting in Connecticut we went again and interviewed Lorraine because they were the investigators on that case so right. they were you know I mean the movie isn't inaccurate in saying they were kind of the Ghostbusters of their age. That's really true. Mm-hmm. So, and and the thing about the chickens, which I just think is hilarious, she really does have chickens in her house. Really? So I don't remember the scene in the movie where where Vera's out in the back and she's feeding the chickens. She insisted on putting that scene in because she knew about the chickens in the house. They're mm-hmm. actually in the house though. 
Wow. They're yeah. like she pets. keeps them in their pets in her house. I, it, while she says, "Silly, did you think uh, Vera gave a good performance?" She did. I, she thought, did. She was really I thought she was very good. I, it wasn't the performances that, although Patrick Wilson was a little oddly cast. We I thought, thought so too. I discussed that. That's we, probably just out of comfort. I, I, that, well, right? first of all, yeah, I, I knew discussed Ed it with somebody Ed on the was, way out of the theater. But also, his accent was going in and out. Like sometimes he would be like that New England thing, and then sometimes he just wasn't. And it was, it was. I don't know. I, I like him as an actor a lot, and I thought he was good in the movie. But yeah, when they showed like a picture of them at the end, I was like, "Whoa, he looks." He was, no, no, Ed yeah. was a big, burly, you know, yeah. dark circles under his eyes. I mean, he was very like, very kind of Gandolfini or something. Could have made maybe too much bad, better yeah. idea. It, it, that's yeah. the thing with casting. I God mean, I, I, I love the Conjuring, so I don't have it. But perspective changes everything once you mm-hmm. have that once story. You, know the yeah. people, you can't. Yeah. It just you can't didn't really battle. do it for me because yeah. I just you know. You know, I know the story too well. That's, yeah. It was too close to home. Now, yeah. since you worked on Amityville, yeah. have you you've seen my Amityville story? I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't as <laughs> offended by it as I thought I'd be. Honestly, the problem with it is that the Lutz sons, Chris and and Danny, um, I don't know if I should even name them on here, but uh, you know, they have a real anger toward their their adopted father. They call him a the stepfather. He wasn't their eh, that's stepfather. That's on Wikipedia. That's nothing you know, new. It's, it's, to me, it's a little sad to air your family's dirty laundry in a documentary. And I think a lot of the things that were in there were, were true, but sadly misstated. Mm-hmm. Do you think the thing about George... I actually found it kind of tragic. I mean, the whole thing, I actually found it just a little bit Well, sad. I think it was. Even as somebody who knew oh, yeah. nothing, yeah. I thought it was tragic. But it, it, he was a very unreliable narrator. You didn't know That's what, exactly what right. Leave, I right. thought he was, yeah, just as crazy as the rest of them. Yeah. So. But, but I mean, the story about George kind of ushering in things and already, do you think that I mean, was there abs- much about It's that? absolute nonsense. I okay, mean, I knew the man. I mean, he was extremely... <laughs> wow. Um, it's hard to even begin to go down that road without, you know... Yeah, I want to ask down, you yeah. if you believe... Since you know, I, you know the here's background the thing. Of the story. I do believe that something really happened that terrified them in that house. It mm. wasn't made up as a hoax for money to make a book and a movie. And like, how would you, especially in 1976, have had the yeah, foresight no, to wouldn't. know, oh, this is going to be a big deal and we can cash in on this yeah. story? That just, there's no possible way. Well, and also, and also to put yourselves in the limelight like that where you're going to fall under this kind of scrutiny. They just thought it was going to be a book that would come and go. I've met a they lot just of people know. who've gone into houses. Nothing. Who don't even believe in the supernatural? Mm-hmm. Who have felt something really heavy yep. in a house where just maybe a suicide or a murder happened? Talk about a house where a whole family yeah. were murdered mm-hmm. in their Without beds, doubt. Yeah. face down. There was some bad juju. We'll There's going to be bad yeah, juju. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, that uh, residue was still. You it was know. Well, probably there. And, and okay. I mean, not only that. I mean, even if you're a total skeptic, which I am, pretty mm-hmm. much on everything paranormal, mm-hmm. the the most unexplained thing that no one can figure out is those ni- initial murders, how they were carried yeah, out. Right. You cannot hearing. explain it. It is so bizarre. Because there's no silencer. There's right. no, there's no silencer, silencer, no drugs, nobody right. moved from their bed. And of course you're going to hear f- like six rifle shots. Could they prove off. that eight, their bodies eight, weren't eight. rearranged? Yeah. Could they, they well, could all, prove the, all the, the trajectory, the bullets went uh, through the body, right. through the mattress. It's, it's what, that's one of the most terrifying... Well, I mean, I've never done the research on this. Well, I mean, if you've got a hunting, a hunting rifle will reverb about a mile in every direction. And no one heard it. So and once no one, one goes, everyone now else this, would run. And you, got, you know what the neighborhood in Amityville is like. It is not like in the movie where the house is sitting on the lake by itself. There are houses right next to it. Yeah. Right. All the way down the block, all the way on the other side of the creek. You would have heard everyone in the neighborhood would have heard it, but eight shots in the middle of the night. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. No, it's 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 one of the creepiest mysteries. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. It's just without a doubt. I'm such a skeptic on it. I need mm. to research this more. It sounds yeah. kind of fascinating. It's interesting. I mean, all I can tell you guys is that knowing the real family as I have and that I do is that in both Lee George Lutz and, and his ex wife Kathy, they both passed on, but they were truly affected by whatever went on there. Uh, um, whether it was, you know, I don't think it was the blood coming out of the walls and the, you know, all of the things that you saw in the movie, which were the, was the Hollywood version. But I think it was something that changed their lives. They became different people after that. Mm. And um, it was all very serious. Them. George Letts was the kind of guy who we, we would be sitting around like, a, like he would, he, I, I just wish he hadn't died when he did because he would be a part of all of this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, he was always game. But he loved it. People loved to tell them their stories about things that had happened to them that they couldn't explain because he understood. Oh. You know, he became kind of a teacher in his later years, kind of in a weird way, like a healing kind of thing, because he was somebody that didn't just disbelieve the, 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 the you know, these, these notions, these stories that people have, have experienced. Um, but anyway, but he was a very charismatic, very funny, very lighthearted, you know, when he wanted to be. And... But when the topic of that house would come up and what happened to them, it like his energy would change in a way that you could feel the energy in the room shift. Mm. It was that intense. Wow. That serious. And 
it, it, it was palpable. It was something that you could actually feel. And you could see this is his body. He, he would go from this to this, just shrinking in his chair, shrinking into it, like becoming a different person. A lot of those true stories are uh, broken families or families that have been, you know, yeah. come together, mm-hmm. yep. yeah, the entity and things like that, That's where right. they're often, there's something mm-hmm. missing. There's always yeah. something. Well, more. And, and, yeah, and Melissa, who's, who, who is the young, the young daughter, if you remember in the movie, and she had the friend Jody, mm. which was the, you know, she called it the pig. Um, but she still holds to it. She remembers it very well. She said that it was like a little boy that would come and visit her in her room. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is a whole other podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting into. We'll come back to that one. <laughs> to be continued. Yeah, I hope people listen yeah. to the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if anyone listens this far in. <laughs> 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 so, that was a good story. Um, so quick, we always uh, we usually start each show with what we've seen, but we're going to do it super quick. Just if you've seen it, or if you've seen anything interesting in the last week, um, oh, you saw the Conjuring. You just Conjuring said, was yeah. It. yeah. Oh, well, I, saw, I didn't get to mention it last week, but I saw VHS two, mm, which right. I told you that I hated it. Did you? <laughs> I haven't yeah. seen it. Yet. Hated. I didn't hate it as much as one. I, 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 I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Wow. Yeah. I like. I like one better. I oh, wow. am wow. inclined to call one masochistic, and I never use that. Yeah, no, if you didn't like Safe Haven, you're crazy. No, I agree yeah. with. I agree no, with Safe you on Haven. The, I liked. Safe Radio Haven Silence. was amazing. I, awesome. agree, I agree with you on the on because I again I, and I've said it before. I almost checked out of the movie, the first one, right off the bat because of how uh, how sexist it was, but uh, <laughs> masochistic, misogynistic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I stuck around. It's it's worth it for that. But there was something about every skit that I liked. Even if I didn't like the full skit, there was like an idea or something in each one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, all right, that's interesting. And then the last one with Radio Silence is That was my awesome. favorite. That, that was, was awesome. like the only it's one that great. redeemed right. it for and me. And then when I heard about two, I got all excited because they were like, oh, we understand. We're going to make them all like that one. But quite frankly, there's nothing in VHS 2 that's even remotely scary. Mm. It's yeah, all it's not gimmick. A scary. Well, Do I don't. I, I don't agree with Safe Haven. I think Safe Haven's a great story yeah, on its, its own. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, you broke you you built it up as uh-huh. this is the best short film you're ever <laughs> going to see. Well, and I said I the best like, found footage short film, and I still I think it is. But then, but the other thing is, it's it's halfway into the movie, and it's like right. I didn't like the first one right. at all with Adam Wingard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's terrible. The in between stuff. The second one is like an interesting take on zombies, but it was like, but I'm so sick of freaking zombies. I'm so sick of zombies at this point. It's like, I don't even care that it's a point of view zombie thing. And it was done better in ABC. So then you're, then you're 45 minutes into the movie, and it's like, well, I don't like anything so far. Yeah. Whereas the first one, it's like, yeah. all right, well, I like that idea. I like this idea. You know what I mean? So halfway through the movie, I'm already pissed off. And then Safe Haven's good. I'm like, all right. I, I kind of like the alien one the best because it had at least a moment or two that I thought could be scary. Um, but yeah, I just I, I, I think so their intention coming, was to make you laugh. I think it was meant to be more of a comedy version. Yeah, but that's the first but, one was but that's, scary. unfortunately that's the the shame because they got it perfect with that radio silence. That yeah. last skit yeah. is was so, smart. so goddamn good. great, so good. Yeah. yeah, that was the only good part of the first one. Oh uh, um, no, I, I think Bruckner's was the best one. I love Bruckner's one, the first one. I love that creature. Mm, so that's the misogyny. So Lovecraftian. Yeah. I love that creature. Mm. You made me make that sound. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like that one too. We, we can agree to what's disagree. Coming up, yeah. What's coming up? Uh, your next. Your next. Your next. Yeah. Your next Bowen, who we there, loved he dearly. Last, he was on last week. Before mm-hmm. he hacked my Twitter account, uh, I did see the new <laughs> Brian De Palma film. <laughs> and then so you it was oh, very, no, it was very weird. Wait, like, so what? I, I'm late, late at night, and I tweet, uh, "Hey, the new De Palma films on VOD. Good night, Twitter." So I watched the new Brian De Palma okay, film, and then as soon as it ended, I just wrote, "Oh dear, De Palma." Went to bed. Next morning, my Twitter had been hacked, and everyone was getting sent things. It was Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma. No, hacked my Twitter. Are you kidding me? I mean, Come I can't on. prove it, but and, you want to believe it. And he's not on Twitter, and probably doesn't use technology. <laughs> yeah, but, but some somebody minion, in the, bro- the De Palma <laughs> can't. Twitter. Some minion. And he's uh, like your favorite director. He's no, he's one. I think he's it was a Jim Hill. I, look, no, uh, De Palma's <laughs> De Palma's always walking a line between completely ridiculous and pure cinema, and he's usually falling on ridiculous. But when he gets it right, like to me, Dress to Kill, yes. uh, Body Double, Sisters, But Carrie. also ridiculous, but, but, but the, yeah, great. But there's, yeah. within, even, and then there's movies like Snake Eyes and that, that to me are like uh. borderline, like the most ridiculous, and this film like started on target, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, and then at some point I'm just like, nope, sorry, done. You know, because uh. he's just contrived, like mm-hmm. he just contrives these cinema scenes. So I, I love watching De Palma films, but then... That doesn't mean it's a good film. Right. This is it's, Passion you're talking this about. This is right? Passion, yeah, 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 which okay. is a remake of a French film from last year called Love Crime. Uh, you know, it was an okay story, but it just, uh, I don't know. It felt like maybe 20 years ago would have mm-hmm. been 
mm. played well. A very eighties kind of storyline. Body, body double. Good death scene. Yeah, it, it was very much like a mixture of body double and femme fatale. Mm. Those two films of his, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It very much. And it's you know it's good. The actor Rachel McAdams is in it, trying mm. to be sexy. Yeah, You're yeah. like, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting. It looks good. I would still say it's better than a lot of new films. Mm. Like it's more entertaining. But yeah, it didn't. It didn't really. I, I saw the trailer to Dark Man at the last Secret Sixteen, and that was more fun. <laughs> <laughs> like watching the trailer to Dark Man again I was like I want to watch that again it's hilarious <laughs> which was fun um, I'm doing a piece for Fango on eco horror films so I've been watching a ton of those so I watched like The Long Weekend and um, I watched Beneath again nice. and uh, yeah just a whole lot of eco horror films that's so cool that's been kind of it Right on. Oh, nice. Have you guys seen anything cool in the last week or two? Friday the 13th, parts 1 through 12. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Again and again and again and again. No. Wow. Um, I got to ask you, because you, you just did a commentary for this. <laughs> Seven hour long commentary. Yeah. I mean, Sitting in front of his microphone is giving me the the heebie-jeebies, only because I just we did this. I mean, we we, we, yeah. we did a seven almost seven hour commentary. You got on. bathroom breaks, right? We've got five Barely. hours to go on this two hour <laughs> <laughs> I need a bathroom on, guys. break, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah we actually, wrap up. The did breaks you, were like maybe two minutes, three. Did tops, you do one for we, Never Sleep we, Again? We were like on a schedule. We had to get it done. We did a very drunken one for Never Sleep Again, okay. um, well, which you I were don't drunken. remember, yeah, but yeah. people say that they enjoy it. I don't know why you'd listen to a four-hour commentary on a documentary, yeah, well, but what people were, What were we talking about? I have no fucking idea. I, okay. I just remember a lot of red wine. Yeah, but the good with the commentary on, on Crystal Lake actually it was good. It was uh, Luke Ravalowski, who is our one of our co editors, who came in later in the show to to kind of give us a boost, which was we needed. Um, and Andrew went off and for on to another project. He was working for J.J. Abrams for a while. Uh, nice. Bad Robot. Um, so he, when during his absence, Luke came on, and he's an Uber Friday fan. So he was kind of like the perfect sort of host for the commentary. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it was myself, and it was Peter Brackey, mm-hmm. just riffing about every nuance of Friday the 13th for seven. I don't know how we, it goes back to my long, long relationship with Peter is like, we, we just sort of vibe on that stuff together. So it was kind of easy <laughs> in that way. Um, but, uh, we were fucking zonked after that. That was, <laughs> that was too much. I, I will say going back to the recent watches, uh, I just saw the movie, the, uh, the last will and Testament of Rosalind Lee. Oh, uh, the, uh, is that the first film by horror hound? One of the, it's one of more, one of the, one of the magazines I know. Yeah. It just hit uh DVD and I think it's on Netflix instant right uh-huh. now. Right. But for my money, that is the creepiest movie of the year. Wow. Really? wow. Yeah. Cool. It's, the Last Will and Testament of Rosalind Lee. Hmm. Uh, it's it's kind Press of an ex- screeners right now. Is that how it's being seen? Or it's it's on Netflix Instant. 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 Oh wow! Yeah, okay, it's, yeah. Cool. And it came out on DVD I think uh, last week. But hmm. but it's it's sort of an experimental haunted house movie. A lot of it's done in just voiceover. But they found I think the creepiest house known to man. Huh. It's full of all these this sort of. Uh, weird religious paraphernalia everywhere, mm-hmm. particularly angels. I don't know if you watch Doctor Who, but the yeah. those weeping angel things right. that freaked out everybody. Right. It's sort of like a feature film version of that in the way the aesthetic is, but it's it's really intelligent. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. The, the atmosphere is super thick. The performances are really good. And I think you especially, Elric, cool. knowing your tastes, yeah. you will flip over this. Wow, That's why cool. so, this one hasn't gotten a lot of our press. Our it hasn't. Statement. I don't know yeah. what, I don't know. It's on the cover of the new room. Well, I mean, it's it was. Yeah, I just read the article about it. I literally it. saw you uh, tweet about it a few days ago, and then I saw it on the cover of Room Org. So now all of a sudden it's like starting to pop up. Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 it's an experimental thing that they did. It's like a, a brisk 70 minutes and, and just super creepy ghost film that, that really, really does it upright nice. um sorry i apologize for my husband's in the, the uh, sound room hey, 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 he's hello. just pointing at himself uh, <laughs> before we wrap up i have to say secret 16 uh, next sunday not this sunday next sunday we have a horror sci-fi 80s double feature and i always have to tell people oh, you should come to this one it's good this is going to be like the best thing we've ever done they're two of my favorite films from the well one especially is one of my favorite film of the 80s and they're both kind of a little more obs- not the main big mainstream 80s films, but these are going to be fun. This mm-hmm. is going to be a fun night. You can't say what they are. I can't. Okay. Except that they're 80s sci-fi horror. 16. I will plug Scare LA. Night of the Comet. Scare night of the Comet. Scare LA coming up this weekend. <laughs> um, we've got a couple of panels there. Ryan Turek from Bloodcast and I are teaching a class on marketing your indie horror film. Um, we have a panel on um, kind of the current state of horror, but I hate that name, so I think I called it Terrifying Trends. Yes. Um, and Rob G is moderating. I'm so, so, so is, that's the rumor. Uh. Yeah. And um, so I think. And short films. Uh, and Elric's curating. Yeah, curating. I, uh, 
favorite six of my favorite horror shorts that have played at Jump Cut within the last year since we were around. I picked The Dump, and I also picked play, uh, Stay at Home Dad. So two of the no. favorite right here. Yeah. And not because they're friends. Uh, I would never take that into account. No, um, no, no. Just not like, <laughs> yeah. They're just great films. Just uh, and, and my favorite short, uh, well, one of my favorite shorts I've seen in years, honestly, was Root of the Problem. I ran into uh, Bria at Jump Cut Yeah, today. Bria Grant. It's just really fun because it nails the kind of weird Twilight Zone vibe. Nice. Uh, of It's just a great little Directed by shirt. Ryan Spindell. Ryan Spindell, and that's yeah. going to play, uh, so we're pretty excited. And about one that. of Drew Daywaltz as well. Yes, one of Drew Daywaltz uh, meet with A.J. Bowen which from I, last week's show. Which I produced. Mm-hmm. Uh, there you go. Oh, oh so no one knows you even do stuff. Mm. This is incredible. Everything's full circle. Right. Everything. <laughs> you just <laughs> <disagree>. <laughs> I know. It's like the <laughs> ring. Uh, so that's so it. yeah, I so think that the, is Saturday and Sunday of this coming weekend, um, downtown where? LA. I don't even know the name. They don't even know. Them. It's just somewhere downtown. Yeah. Just go yeah. around. You'll just find it. Go to the Scarela. <laughs> it's scarela.com. Yeah. You'll find it. Look for Becca. You'll find it. I'll just be hanging out <laughs> in the corner, waving, yeah. pointing. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Uh, thank you guys. Thanks for having us. And we're really very fun. excited. It's to nice it. to be among friends, among the world of the living again. We've been locked away, or I have I haven't been, and seen daylight in a long we just time. Haven't. It's, I just nice think to, you guys need to screening parties. The, the woods screening of, party. Screening yeah, party. Six hour screening party. You could get <laughs> so messed up. <laughs> you really would. Sex and drugs and Crystal I'd, Lake memories. I think yep. be, we would be messed up after that one. Nice. <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, thanks for having us. We'll be Woo. back next week. Bye, awesome. guys. Cool. Take care. Thanks, guys.